Please return to your seats. The program is about to begin. It is going to be exciting, moving, and well worth your time. Don't miss it. If you are mid-conversation, please continue it at the next break, which will be generous. Willkommen til Oslo Freedom Forum. Welcome to the Oslo Freedom Forum. We know some of you are passionate rebels, but please follow these rules to help us run the conference smoothly. Please be seated and turn your phone on silent. You do not want to be the person with a ringing cell phone. Trust me. The Oslo Freedom Forum speakers have worked very hard and have traveled great distances to be here with you and present their message. So please be present and on time. If you have a laptop or an iPad, we request that you sit in the back of the theater so that the light from your devices does not disturb those around you. If, for whatever reason, you have to leave the theater, please do not use the center aisle while leaving or returning to your seat. If you need any help, please ask a staff member. The Oslo Freedom Forum staff are wearing white lanyard badges. Thank you very much and enjoy the day's programming.
Uh, my name is Thor Halverson. That's what it says up there. Um, I founded the Freedom Forum 15 years ago. Uh, it's really quite wonderful when, you know, we started this event, we'd be like, is anyone going to show up in the theater? And today we got too many people showing up at the theater. Um, so thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a real dream for us that uh, 15 years ago we had an idea of just having one event, gathering some of the most heroic voices in the struggle against authoritarianism for like a one-time thing. And the idea was to give them a, an opportunity to both tell us their view of um, the current struggle against tyranny, you know, in the early 2000s, and also do a retrospective on their lives. So we started choosing people who we thought were the best embodiments of heroism uh, and the nobility of the human spirit. People like Elie Wiesel, and who survived the Holocaust, and Václav Havel, um, the president of the Czech Republic, Harry Wu, who spent time in a labor camp in China, Vladimir Bukovsky, who had been in and out of Soviet psychiatry clinics, because if you disagreed with the Soviet regime, then you were considered insane, and where he was, uh, did a hunger strike and had his nose broken nine times when they forced fed him. We had Armando Valladares, who spent 22 years in a Cuban prison. We had planned to have Alexander Solzhenitsyn, but as we were planning the event, he passed away and had a stroke. So we really wanted to do this one event, and it became something slightly different. It was more like a passing of the torch. We decided to invite some new activists, and then we decided to do it in Norway of all places, and that's a whole other story, and our, our, uh, our, I could digress into the discussion of what it was like to come to Norway with this idea and, you know, culturally have this fit inside Norway. And I'm, I'm very, very grateful that we have been embraced by Norwegian society, the foreign ministry, the city of Oslo. Um, it, it took a while for them to you know, trust us and get over the skepticism of who are these people who are wanting to do this conference? And is it political? Is it right-wing? Is it, is it left-wing? Is it American? Is it capitalist? Well, what, what are they doing? And really what it is, um, and I, I mentioned this to some people yesterday, what it is, it's a gathering of some of the most dangerous people on planet Earth. People that are so dangerous because the things that they say, the truths, the truths that they tell, are so powerful that people who are holding power, and all of them with one objective, and always only one objective, and that is to collect as much loot as possible. Then once they have the loot, they can't get rid of the power, because if they got rid of the power, they would end up in prison for the rest of their lives. So we have criminal syndicates, you know, whether it's the gangsters in Beijing who are threatening Taiwan, or the troops that are rolling into Ukraine from Russia. These, all of these criminal syndicates continue to do what they do. And the people that we bring here are some of the most powerful voices to talk about what the impact is of authoritarianism or how to fight it using nonviolence and how to succeed. And so again, this is a gathering of so many different people. You know, I, I tell people sometimes it, it seems if you've ever seen Star Wars, the scene in the bar, you know, where you have all those weird people walking around, this is kind of like what the Oslo Freedom sometimes, sometimes is. You know, you have, you have all sorts of crazy people, intense people, people who are deeply traumatized, people who have healed from trauma, um, all of them coming together in solidarity. And so um, I, I just wanted to take, take a moment, it's been 15 years, uh, this is gonna be a very special couple of days, um, so, uh, if you have a badge, do not lose your badge, because getting a badge tomorrow is going to be a nightmare. We're going to try and address that as much as we can. However, um, make sure you take an opportunity to look at the exhibits in the main hall, uh, look a little bit about the history of the Freedom Forum, and consider yourselves part of this community. Because what this is ultimately is a community, and for a lot of these people, this is like their family. Um, the, the best way that I can communicate to you um, how welcome we are here, and for, for our international guests, it's very important. Um, 
is to invite the president of the Norwegian parliament to give some remarks and welcome all of us to his country. So uh, please join me in welcoming the president of the Norwegian parliament. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor and pleasure for me to open Oslo Freedom Forum 2023. Happy 15th anniversary. I'm so impressed by how this has become such an important event during this time. I'm also deeply honored to be here with you. You are the champions of freedom in the world. You stand up for human rights and carry a strong determination to make a difference in spite of the daily pressure and threats many of you face. Thank you for your courage. Thank you for standing up for human rights, freedom and democratic values. And thank you for coming to Oslo. Dear friends, I was born in Tehran in 1982, at a time when Ayatollah Khomeini was starting to tighten his iron grip. A few memories from my early childhood in Tehran. But I remember that we often had to go out in the streets at night. What I first thought were stars in the sky, I soon realized were bombs. My parents' dreams in 1979 was a revolution that would bring freedom and democratic values. Instead, extremists took over. During the long and bloody war, in 1987, my parents and I fled to Norway. Every single day, I'm grateful to live in a country built on democracy and human rights. Almost every time I lead the meetings in my parliament, I can hear the sound of the Norwegian people outside my parliament. Solidarity with Iranian people or Ukraine or domestic issues a country where you can speak truth to power without being punished, a country where freedom of expression is respected and protected, respected and protected. The same values that young people are fighting for throughout Iran today. Through their peaceful protests, these young people have shown incredible resilience and determination at considerable personal risk. My heart bleeds for the tragic death of Masa Amini last fall, and all the young Iranians who have been killed, jailed, tortured, and risked their lives in their fight for a better future. We will rather die than live under this brutal regime, says the young people in Iran. That's a strong message to the regime and to the international community. I'm glad that Iran is on the agenda. The human rights situation in my native country is intolerable, and I will not stop saying so out loud until the fight has been won. Dear friends, in this Nordic corner of Europe, most of us have come to take democracy and peace almost for granted. Russia's brutal attack on Ukraine was a wake-up call and a turning point in European history. Last year, I visited Ukraine, Kyiv, and Butsha. I met with a local priest that told me that he had conducted 400 funerals in two weeks. People he had confirmed, people he had married, found in mass graves. That's evil. Last month, the chairman of Ukrainian parliament my friend, Ruslan Stefanchuk, was my guest of honor on 7th of May, our Constitution Day. It felt deeply symbolic to stand shoulder to shoulder on the balcony of the parliament as we waved to the children's parade in the streets of Oslo. What we celebrated in Norway, the Ukrainians are fighting for on the battlefield today. Friends, we are all responsible for advocating and defending democratic principles. 
even when it's uncomfortable to do so. In the time we live in, this is more important than ever. We owe it to the Ukrainian, we owe it to the Iranians, we owe it to the champions of freedom all over the world. I'm grateful for how all of you and Oslo Freedom Forum constantly remind us that addressing human rights violation is our common duty. Dear everyone, and to my friends in Ukraine and Iran, a free person has many dreams. An unfree person has only one dream. Let us be their voice. I wish you every success with the conference and the celebration of solidarity. Keep on pushing, keep on fighting. Thank you for your attention and welcome to my beautiful country, Norway. Thank you, Monsieur. Thank, Thank you. you. And now I, it's uh, my great uh, privilege. I'm, I'm grateful to be able to introduce the, the mayor of Oslo, Marianne Borgen, who is uh, uh, like, you know, you, you've, you've noticed, I mean, I think it's amazing, by the way, that, we, that there's an Iranian who's head of the Norwegian parliament, president of the Norwegian parliament. That, that's simply extraordinary. If only um, we had more people who were exiles go into Western governments, we would have a completely different perspective on what the struggle against tyranny is. I, uh, I, I, I, we were talking earlier, I don't know if you've seen the Pekin art car. Um, it would be so cool if he drove it all the way to Parliament and, and brought some attention to it. And, and drove it under the banners of the Oslo Freedom Forum. If you haven't seen, the city has essentially welcomed us. There are banners for the Oslo Freedom going all the way up to the palace and all the way down to the train station. Um, so uh, please welcome for some, some more welcoming before we really get started with the program, uh, Marianne Borgen, the mayor of Oslo. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's really a privilege for me to welcome you all to Oslo and to Oslo Freedom Forum 2023. For 15 years, Oslo Freedom Forum has been a unique forum for people from all over the world coming together to discuss and protect human rights and democracy. As you all know, we live in troubled times. Democracy is in decline worldwide, and respect for national borders, human rights, children's rights, and the respect for human dignity is threatened in many ways. This is a worrying development. Therefore, it's so important, uh, probably more important than ever, to come together and discuss what we can do to change this development. To secure freedom of speech, equal opportunities, to combat climate change and show solidarity and act in accordance with human rights and children's rights. Democracies often disappear slowly, bit by bit. They weather away from for over some time. And I like to quote the German historian, Gritschneider, who said this, those who fall asleep in a democracy may wake up in a dictatorship. Free and independent journalists and free press are crucial for developing trust and to secure broad information to the people. This is basic for all open democracies and democratic societies. The situation today is that fake news and the sp spread of disinformation is testing all of us and is a threat to a critical and open dialogue. Political control of the press is dangerous, and the increase of a wide range of medias with high economic or political interests, which is often invisible, makes it difficult for people to know what sort of information and news they can trust or not. This means that forward-looking media policies and proactive media authorities are becoming more and more important. Let me quote Maria Ressa the Nobel Peace Prize laureate from 2021. She said, without facts, you can't have truth. Without truth, you can't have trust. And without trust, we have no shared reality, no democracy, and it becomes impossible to deal with our world's existential problems, climate, coronavirus, and the battle for truth. 
end of quote. Standing up for democracy and human rights in the face uh, of danger and rep uh, repression requires tremendous courage in many countries. And those who take this fight deserve our solidarity. And among these today are the Ukrainians. Putin's brutal invasion of Ukraine affects us all and deeply. The Ukrainians' fight is the defense of their own country and sovereignty, but also the defense of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. We stand with the Ukrainian people. In Oslo, we have committed ourselves to help where we can by receiving refugees and also contributing to the reconstruction after the war. We experience, and I'm very proud of that, we experience massive support for this among our inhabitants. The city of Oslo, best known in, uh, is probably best known internationally as the venue of the Nobel Peace Prize uh, ceremony that takes place here in this very city, the 10th of December each year. Over the course of time, a large number of Nobel Peace Prize laureates have delivered their Nobel speeches in Oslo. And much wisdom of peace, dialogue and courage has been shared with an international audience. In 2022, Oleksandra Matvichuk from the Center for Civil Liberties in Ukraine, she spoke about the need for solidarity. And she said, I quote her as well, I will allow myself to reach out to people around the world and call for solidarity. You don't have to be Ukrainians to support Ukraine. It is enough just to be humans, end of quote. So dear friends, in a true democracy, everyone has freedom of expression and the same opportunity to participate in a society. The team of this year's Oslo Freedom Forum is celebrating solidarity. Oslo Freedom Forum is a constant reminder of our duty to address human rights violations and threats to democracy. We can only do this together in solidarity with all of those who live in oppressive and authoritarian regimes. So once again, thank you for your important work and good luck with Oslo Freedom Forum 2023. And once again, heartily welcome to Oslo. I hope you have wonderful days here and a fruitful dialogue and discussions. Thank you so much. Thank you. My name is Keta Kanjiana. Quite complicated, right? But I make it easy for you. Just call me K. My name means little princess in Malagasy language. But uh, obviously, I'm not little anymore. And unfortunately, I'm not a princess. Sorry to disappoint you. I know you guys know Madagascar for that silly cartoon, isn't it? Haha. <laughs> And I really wish that our reality was such a fun, but it's not the case. Because, unfortunately, 75% of our population live in extreme poverty on less than $2 a day. 
And I can relate, coming from a quite poor family, we didn't have much, and at school, I noticed how colleagues, classmates who had more than us were treated differently. But I'm very proud of that story because it's mine and it shaped who I am today. You see, I grew up in a family where our parents, especially my mom, ingrained in us that we always must work hard to earn everything and forge our own path with honesty and integrity. My mom had a deep sense of justice and fairness. You know, she was the kind of woman to shout out in a crowded bus when she noticed something wrong. And we were like a bit ashamed, but yeah, she knocked it. And uh, when my father died when I was 11, and it's been 30 years now, 30 years yesterday, my mom worked very hard to raise me and my brother. And she faced a lot of hardship, but at the same time, she was the personification of joy and happiness. I owe her a lot. And I will always remember forever what she used to tell us. Always do what is good and always stand for justice. So I guess that's why, starting from high school, I decided that I will contribute at my small scale to my communities and countries' well-being and development. After more than 15 years of volunteer engagement within civil society, trying to politically empower young people and women, trying also to campaign and advocate for the rights of people with disabilities and teaching the art of nonviolent civil resistance, I realized one day that all of the efforts that we invest in development, democratization, or human rights promotion will be sooner or later ruined by corruption. Therefore, curbing corruption became my main target. You see, corruption is at the origins of this uh, extreme poverty that I mentioned beforehand. Because our successive rulers in Madagascar chose corruption as a way of governing this country. And now, corruption has become normalized in the Malagasy way of life. Each and every sector of the nation is contaminated by corruption. Look, you need a passport? Expect to be extorted. Are you a female student? You dreaming of becoming a neurosurgeon? Expect to be sextorted. Wanna launch your own business? Well, insert a bribery line in your budget. Are you sick and you need emergency care? A small bribe can skip the line for you and potentially save your life. Wildlife trafficking, all those turtles being smuggled to China, they are fueled by corruption. And it even affects our elections. In 2013, one of the candidates to our presidential elections spent more than Barack Obama for his campaign. Can you imagine that? Spending 43 million dollars in a single campaign in a country where people are starving? That's insane, yeah? In 2018, 36 candidates were running for president. 36. And money was flowing around the country for rigging the elections and bribing electoral court officials. And one of the candidates at that time complained that he was short of $100 million to win the elections. Well, I bet that you guys have heard about the Russian influence on the US elections. We also have this in Madagascar because our elections have also been influenced by the Russian. Our investigations in 2018 showed that the Russian were, had a deal with uh, our former Malagasy president, so two mining companies wanted to finance his re-election campaign. And later on, the Malagasy journalist Gail Borgia, she won a Pulitzer Prize for uncovering how Russian dark money, along with political operatives from Vladimir Putin's mercenary chief Yevgeny Prigozhin, 
tried to steal the elections in Madagascar. But you will tell me, where does come all of this money? That's what I just mentioned, from kleptocratic sponsors, but also from the trafficking of natural resources. Then this year in November, we will have presidential again, elections again in Madagascar. And we know that the Russian and other dark sponsors are already there. But this time, we won't let our elections be stolen again. We won't let big money rule no more. We won't let political corruption steal away our dignity again. No. You know, corruption is not unique to Madagascar. We are all struggling with it, isn't it? But in a poor country like mine, I feel that the burden is much more heavier than elsewhere because corruption takes away from our plate the already scarce resources that we have. Corruption kills. Corruption leaves people powerless. And corruption really destroys lives. And most of the time, it happens in total impunity because our judiciary is not independent. It is influenced by those who are in power. In Madagascar, if you report some abuses to the authorities, then you will be the one to be jailed. It's not the perpetrators of corruption who are jailed and sentenced. It's those who blow the whistle against it. Last year, for instance, an environmental defender was murdered in my country. Eight people have been sentenced for his death, but we do suspect that the real, the person that who masterminded that, that crime are still free and benefit from high-level political protection eased by corruption. That's also happened to me and my boss, the chair of Transparency International in Madagascar last year. You see, we grow this small red exotic fruit named lychee in Madagascar, and exports of lychees to the European Union could potentially feed thousands of small-scale farmers in Madagascar. Unfortunately, the profit from that trade serve a few militia, a monopoly run by politically connected people. It's all wasted. And when we blew the whistle against that big business, then we've been summoned by the police. And we are still facing potential jail sentence. But tell me, are anti-corruption fighters troublemakers? Well, if reporting corruption is troublemaking, and if claiming for justice for victims of corruption is troublemaking, well, yeah, we are troublemakers, and we are proud of it. <laughs> We've been pushing for Mad in Madagascar for the adoption for a Whistleblowers Protection Act for more than five years now. And the government says it's not a priority. How many deaths do we want? Look, I'm a big fan of people power. And I'm still dreaming of a global revolution against corruption. So as we are here today in this room, I would like to ask you a favor. I would like you to commit for the fight against corruption, not only in or for Madagascar, but in your respective country, in your hometown, in your school, in your village, in your churches, everywhere. Stand against corruption. If you are a lawyer, defend anti-corruption activists for free. If you're a donor organization, then stop funding corrupt government. If you're a journalist, keep putting corruption under the spotlight. Name and shame when needed. If you're a teacher, teach your students a sense of integrity. It matters. Let's raise together a non-violent anti-corruption army. I know that all of this requires courage and determination, but also strategy, collaboration, and I know that all of us can make the difference. Don't sell your soul for a bunch of money, for a trip, 
for a House opposition, please say no to any form of corruption. So now, to conclude with, I would love to see you stand up with me. Stand up, please stand up. And repeat after me. Stop corruption now. Stop corruption now. Once again, stop corruption now. Thank you, guys. Yay. Good morning. Uh, so today I want to talk to you about the weakness of strong states. Uh, but before we get to that, I have to say a little bit about where I stand. Uh, I regard myself as a classical liberal. This is not liberal in the European sense of a kind of center-right pro-market uh, party. Uh, it's not liberal in the American sense of being left of center. It's classical liberalism which is a doctrine that I think almost everybody in this room actually shares, if you believe in universal human rights, because liberals believe in the essential equality of all human beings, that no particular group of human beings defined by race, by ethnicity, by gender, should be raised above uh, any other group because everybody is entitled to equal dignity. And liberals believe that that dignity needs to be protected by a rule of law, by checks and balances, on strong executive power. That's what I mean when I say I'm a liberal. But liberalism has been under attack, under very serious attack in recent years, and it comes from various sources. The uh, most obvious one is the geopolitical threat that is posed by these two great powers, China and Russia, that are fully consolidated authoritarian powers. And they've been arguing that liberalism is an obsolete doctrine, that the West is in terminal decline. They, Western governments, democratic governments can't make decisions, they can't benefit their own societies, uh, and therefore they represent a wave of the future. Uh, and we've seen the direct threat that they pose to democracy around the world in Russia's invasion of Ukraine last February uh, 24th. Uh, but there's other threats as well within liberal democracies because we've seen the rise of populist nationalist parties beginning in my own country in the United States with the election of Donald Trump and the continuing threat represented by his version of America first. We've seen this in India with Prime Minister Modi. We've seen this in Hungary with Viktor Orban. There's a long list of populist groups that have used the legitimacy conferred by democratic elections to try to dismantle the liberal constraints uh, on their power. They all want to be strong men. And we've seen uh, the decline of democracy in the aggregate. Freedom House that tracks this in its annual Freedom in the World surveys has noted that for 17 consecutive years, there's been a decline in the aggregate number of democracies. And there's a qualitative change as well because this decline has been affecting the world's largest democracies, the United States uh, and India. And we've seen setbacks in countless other countries that you're very uh, familiar with, in, uh, in Myanmar, in Tunisia, uh, in Nicaragua, in uh, El Salvador. You have strongmen leaders that are uh, vying for power. So I want to do a couple of things. I want to, first of all, explain why it's actually better to live in a liberal society, liberal 
define it the way that I just did. And there's really basically three reasons that I think have endured over the three centuries that liberalism has existed. The first is a pragmatic uh, reason that liberalism is a way of governing over diversity. It's a way, you know, it, it originated in the middle of the 17th century after the European wars of religion when Protestants and Catholics were killing each other for a 150 year period. And liberals said, look, we shouldn't argue over uh, ultimate ends. We should just agree to tolerate one another and let each of us uh, pick our own, you know, religious uh, confession. And since then, that's been the way that liberal societies have bought peace. And you can see the threat to that in a place like India now, which was created as a liberal republic in the 1940s, but is now being turned into a Hindu, uh, a country with a Hindu national identity, which then excludes, you know, at least the 200 million Indians who are not Hindu, who are Muslim, right? And that is going to lead to a lot of violence. So that's a pragmatic reason. Second reason has to do with uh, the moral argument for uh, liberalism, which is that all of us as human beings are equal in the sense that we all have moral autonomy. Autonomy. We can distinguish between right and wrong, and that fundamental ability to make choices uh, is the fundamental right that a liberal society uh, protects. So it elevates the dignity and recognizes the dignity of individuals by giving them rights. And then finally, the third justification is an economic one. Liberals also protect the right to own private property, to uh, engage in commercial transactions, and therefore, Historically, liberal societies have been the richest societies in the world, and even, even China. So China is in no way a liberal political uh, entity, but it adopted uh, an openness to the market beginning in 1978, and its remarkable economic growth since then has been due to the fact that they accept something like property rights and the freedom to uh, transact. So those are three basic reasons why I think liberal societies are better. The problem uh, also exists on the authoritarian side because they are not as strong as they th seem to be from the outside, right? That, uh, and you can see this in the things that have happened just in the past year to Russia and China. In a liberal society, you limit power by spreading it out, by giving it to other institutions, by creating checks and balances, and ultimately by requiring the consent of your whole society before you make an important decision. What did Putin do before the invasion of Ukraine? If you remember, he was sitting at the end of a 30-foot table from his defense minister, you know, his foreign minister, because he was so afraid of any kind of human contact. He obviously did not consult broadly, even within his own elite, as to the wisdom of invading Ukraine. He certainly had no idea what was happening in Ukraine itself and the way that a Ukrainian nation had been developing over the past decade in ways that he simply didn't understand. And as a result, he made one of the biggest uh, mistakes that I've seen a leader make in my lifetime, launching this catastrophic war that has actually cemented Ukrainian nationhood, has grievously weakened Russia with consequences that we uh, at this point can't really anticipate. If you look at China, there is a similar uh, mistake made by Xi Jinping uh, over his zero COVID policy. This is not a policy that uh, was widely discussed within the Chinese elite because there's really only one decision maker uh, there, that is uh, Xi Jinping. And because he was so associated with the policy, they kept it going for much longer than uh, it made any sense to do until the country uh, erupted in uh, protests over this. And so decision-making in a concentrated uh, authoritarian regime is of low quality in the long run. They don't make decisions. They don't make good decisions. And furthermore, they are not legitimate. Iran is another example of a country that, uh, where something like 60% of all of the college graduates uh, in that society that still remains a pretty well-educated one are female. Uh, and yet you have this centralized authoritarian dictatorship uh, that deliberately gives women a lower status than it does men. And although the protests have been repressed, violently repressed over the past few months, the ones that began with Masa Amini's uh, 
killing. Uh, that society is seething, and the regime's legitimacy is uh, extremely low. And so I think that it's important for people that believe in liberal democracy and are struggling against authoritarian regimes to remember that there are these fundamental weaknesses in that authoritarian model. You cannot judge their performance against that of a liberal democracy in any short time period, like a decade. It really does have to do with the long-term sustainability uh, of that model. And I think that liberal societies, once they get their act together, uh, uh, are much more sustainable in that sense. I don't, for a minute, think that uh, our liberal democracies are blameless in the troubles and the criticisms that they have received. They have not been decisive. They've not delivered security, peace, economic growth, jobs, all of these other things that their citizens uh, expect. They've not dealt well in particular with the problem of inequality created by, uh, in a way, this globalized liberal international order that we've created, and they need to do much better in that respect if they're going to head off the kinds of populist reactions that we've seen, but that's the advantage of living in a democracy. Uh, you can change course. So I just want to conclude uh, leaving you with a little bit of optimism about uh, the, the relative strengths and weaknesses of these types of systems. At the moment, there's one decisive fight that's going on. It's the one that is occurring uh, in the south and the east of Ukraine right now. And the outcome of that battle is going to have a big impact, not just on Ukraine and Russia, but on the world as a whole, because it's going to demonstrate whether this strong state can actually get away with this kind of naked aggression. So long live democracy, Slava Ukraini, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Frank. Thank you so much. I, I have a, a couple of questions related to your talk. Um, you, you, you, you discuss uh, the issue of weak, the weaknesses of fully authoritarian regimes. How can activists use both the weak legitimacy component and the poor decision making in, in their activism? How, how can they, they weaponize this against the dictatorships? Well, so this is a really tough problem because a strong state looks very strong and it has a lot of uh, repressive potential. And so, you know, from day to day, month to month, uh, there may not be openings uh, to do things. But if this weakness, as I've described, is the case, there will be an opening at some time. There'll be some exogenous event, a crisis, a pandemic, a war, uh, uh, you know, unhappiness about economic conditions that will intervene, and then uh, there will be regime instability. We don't know what's going to happen in Russia if they're beaten by the Ukrainians uh, in this war. Uh, so there will be opportunities, I think, for change in the future. You know, a lot, a lot of people think that this uh, conflict and this confrontation between Russia and, and the free world, which is what's happening in Ukraine, is merely just a, a border dispute or an issue that is historic. Or Would you, would you agree that um, what's going on there from a geopolitical perspective is the single most important confrontation that we've had since the Cold War? And whether or not Ukraine is able to defeat uh, the Putin regime is going to determine the struggle against authoritarianism for the next 50 years. No, absolutely. I mean, Putin says this himself. You know, he didn't like the entire uh, world order that emerged after the collapse of the former Soviet Union. He said that that collapse was the greatest tragedy of the 20th century, and he really wants to reverse that. And it means that what happens in Ukraine isn't just going to stay in Ukraine. It's going to have a uh, either an energizing impact on. Uh, Democrats around the world, or it's going to confirm this authoritarian narrative that they're strong, they know what they're doing, and they can reshape the world as they see fit. Well, so, so again, I just want to underline that th this struggle is the single most important one in our lifetimes, you know, post-Cold War. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned just now, when you were talking about the weaknesses, you mentioned the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So we, we could argue that in China, uh, the zero-tolerance policy was weak decision-making, um, 
but it wasn't that unpopular. And Chinese propaganda and Chinese disinformation um, has infected the country such that the people of China think, oh, the government knew what it was doing, as opposed to what we see on the outside. They were, they were comparing the, the, the death numbers. Uh, they were using all sorts of disinformation about what COVID was doing in the West. How do you respond to, to that criticism of your theory? Well, first of all, I don't know that we really know what the people of China think. You know, at the time of the protests, it was quite remarkable how widespread they were and how bitter people were about the kind of government they had to live under. But there are many other weaknesses in China right now. Basically, uh, their growth rate is not going to be 5% or 3%. It's probably going to be 0, 1%. 20% of Chinese college graduates today are unemployed. You know, you've not seen this kind of economic distress. All of the local governments in China are basically bankrupt, uh, and they don't have the revenues to keep up basic social services. And so, you know, Ch uh, Xi Jinping seems to actually still believe in some version of Maoism. He wants this, the Communist Party con to control the economy, and this is not a formula for great success uh, in the way that we've seen China succeed since 1978. Well, let's hope that it, that the CCP collapses. <laughs> that would be great for humanity. Okay. So, thank you, Frank. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. a lot. So I'm, I'm going to tell you briefly about a, a speaker that was here several years ago. I'm going to talk about Nicaragua. Nicaragua is one of the three fully authoritarian regimes in the Western Hemisphere. The other two, of course, are Cuba and Venezuela. And uh, the current dictator of Nicaragua was elected, and he did the same thing that Hugo Chavez did in Venezuela, which was slowly dismantle the democracy. And there are people uh, like Felix Maradiaga who came to the Oslo Freedom Forum and warned over and over again that this was happening. In 2019, he came here, he spoke, and the last event he had internationally before he returned to Nicaragua was speaking at the Oslo Freedom Forum. He went back to Nicaragua, began organizing against the regime of Daniel Ortega, a very brutal, murderous regime, and he announced that he was going to run for president. And this man is so incredibly dangerous that as soon as he announced that he was going to run for president, he was placed under house arrest. And that wasn't enough. So they put him into a maximum security prison where he was for three years. It's uh, very difficult for us at the Freedom Forum because unlike other conferences, this is one where sadly people sometimes are imprisoned, tortured, or even assassinated. In the case of Felix, he stood his ground. He was eventually uh, freed after a very big campaign uh, seeking his freedom along with many other political prisoners and the dictatorship in what was uh, clearly a, a uh, logistical um, real faux pas by them when, he, when they were expelled from Nicaragua recently. They were expelled and had their citizenships revoked. Just to give you a taste of what that government will do to the people who uh, tell the truths, they will even make them stateless. So we have a very, very uh, moving video of Felix right after he was freed and seeing his daughter and his wife for the very first time, after which we will welcome him to the stage. Please enjoy this very, very moving video. Contame, ¿cómo se siente estar esperando a tu papá después de cuatro años de no verlo? O, bueno, tres años de no verlo. No aguanto mi corazón. ¿Cómo? No te escucho. No aguanto mi corazón porque... Así, ah, está muy emocionada. ¿Y qué es lo primero que le vas a decir a tu papá? Que lo adoro. Ay. Ahí está, mira Alejandra Victoria. Ahí está en ese carro. Con cuidado. Esa belleza.
My name is Felix Maradiaga from Nicaragua. And I was here in this uh, very same town at the Oslo Freedom Forum in 2019. In that occasion, I presented some ideas to many of you here. And one of the ideas is that dictatorships are becoming more sophisticated. I talked about dictatorships 2.0. Dictatorships know that they can inflict a lot of pain, emotional pain in families and distract activists of their work. I also said that for nonviolent movements to be successful, they require of a lifeline. They require for the international community to care. So I went back to Nicaragua. I continued to work on my nonviolent movement against dictator Daniel Ortega, who came back to power in 2007 and since then has been inflicting a lot of pain on the Nicaraguan community. He has expelled out of the country over 3,000 nonprofits, including many charitable organizations. He shut down 20 universities. He has killed close to 400 people, including 45 students. He has persecuted the Catholic Church. And currently, my own bishop, Monsignor Rolando Alvarez, who spoke many times for my release, is currently in prison, facing a sentence of 26 years in prison. This reminded me of my years back in 1997 when I was working in government, and I will speak about that situation. I was working with uh, child soldiers prior to my involvement in the nonviolent movement. But let's revisit my return to Nicaragua. I went back. I launched my political campaign and announced my intentions to run as president representing a broad movement of reconciliation, unification of Nicaragua. I was very few months later placed in house arrest, later arrested under charges of treason, and for 611 agonizing days, I was denied of a right of a lawyer. I didn't have any readings of writing materials. I was placed in one of the most outrageous maximum security prisons in Latin America. I endure things I am not yet prepared to talk in public. But the most painful thing I suffered was not being allowed to have a Bible uh, important to my faith, not being allowed to have a letter or a, at least a phone call with my daughter and my wife, Berta. Even my drinking water had to be delivered daily. My daily quota of drinking water had to be delivered personally by my sister every day outside of the prison alongside the other political prisoners. So I promised myself in those very hard moments that I wanted to share with you a follow-up of my conversation in 2019. Dictators know that by imprisoning um, dissidents, they distract political movements. My wife, Berta Valle, became a relentless advocate for my freedom. And this is happening, yes. This is happening around the world. I see so many children of political prisoners, family members, lawyers such as my own human rights lawyer, Jared Genser, who I really appreciate his work, friends and volunteers at the Human Rights Foundation, uh, Oslo Freedom Forum, working for our release. But what happens is that political movements that want reform, they need to stop for some time to talk about reforms in health, in education, we cannot tackle as we want other complicated issues such as anti-corruption, transparency, electoral reform, because we must work around the issue of arbitrary detention. So I wanted to present to you an idea. I will do an analogy with my work back in 1997. I was 20 years old and I noticed in my job in disarmament that many of the survivals of the uh, civil war in Nicaragua had lost their lower limbs due to anti-personal landmines. The question is why? Well, because landmines were not technically designed to kill, but to mutilate. Because those that designed anti-personal landmines wanted to inflict enormous pain on the combatants even uh, after the war had ended. There was a massive international movement, civil society, not from government, but from civil society to ban landmines because of the suffering that they create even after the war. That is what dictators are doing. 
they have a new political weapon called arbitrary detention. We can do the same that happened with the Ottawa Convention. We can create a global movement against arbitrary detention from civil society. I will invite you towards the end of my talk to uh, end arbitrary detention, and we are telling the story of our own bishop, Bishop Rolando Alvarez. But to do something like this, we need to protect our heart. My message to human rights defenders around the world, the first uh, battle that we need to win is the battle against the very human emotion of revenge. Because we cannot build new free, uh, societies, fair and just countries out of hatred. From my own personal painful experience, I know that this is very hard. In the moments of loneliness, deprivation of food and water, tortured, the feeling of revenge is normal. And don't get me wrong, I believe dictators should go to international criminal courts, but it's not revenge that we want, it's justice. And hatred cannot generate the type of societies that we want in which we honor human dignity. So how do we do that? The message I want to send to my torturers, to my jailers, is that I wish for their children and for their grandchildren not to suffer what my daughter Alejandra suffered. I didn't see her for three years. I want the grandchildren of even those who are against me to live in a free society. So we need to find that that gives us strength and hope. Let me introduce you to the person that gave me that hope, Alejandra. Come to stage, please. Alejandra, I want to honor you and your mom, my wife, the love of my life, Berta, for all the work they did. I want to honor the children of political prisoners around the world. And thank you for keeping me alive, for keeping me committed to love. Love is not our weakness, it's our strength. And through love, we're gonna build a new society with your help and in arbitrary detention and working for the release of Bishop Monsignor Rolando Alvarez. Would you like to share something? I just want to be thankful for um, being here and for all the people who have supported me and my mom when my dad was in here and for the people who have supported other political prisoners. Nicaragua will be free. Thank you. The next talk will be interpreted from the Uyghur language. Please raise your hand if you require a headset, and one will be brought to you in your seat.
Salam, hanımlar, efendiler, hem malabilen yüz görüş gelgimden intayın kursemen. Ben işkime unutmayacağım ahire ve tende hizmet kagan iş ornumden kegen bir avazlık uçurunu tapşırıp aldım. Ulamının ve tende kayıt birip işki cette pinsek çıkış resmiyetini bilirsimle dedi. Ben yolduşum ve işki kızım bilen. Fransa'da yaşayıp atkanda hiç kandak bir siyasi paliyattaki arlaşma kalıgım için hiç nimeden guman kınmayı iş kaptırlık plan bilen ve tenge kayttım. Mini kandak kısmetlerinden kütüp tırva atkalıgını bilmektim. Ben şirkette münasibetlik resmiyetlerini bilgiler atkan vaxtımda tüyüksüz üst saç çıkılıp, mini saç çıkanlık apırıp, Fransa'daki hayatım toğırlık saatlep sonra kılıp, kızımın Şerk Türkistan'ın kök bayrakını özgü orap bir namayıştı çüşken sürütünü aldımgı taşlap verip pasportumunu tahtı aldı. Ben 2017 yılı birinci ayda yani bir kitim sakşi dersi'ye çakırtıldım. Ula pasportumunu kaytırıp birimiz değişti. Bırak işle ula digendek olmadı. Ula sakşi kanda barmak kızımını aldı, barmak kızımını kan aldı, çırayım, köz nurumunu ıskanla kıldı, avazımını ünge aldı. Andın mini karmay şerlik tutup duruş merkezine aparıp, Adem toplayıp cemiyet tertibini buzgan digen tökmetke kol koyuşka mecburladı. Ben amalsız kol koydum. Andın ulanın seyrek renglik, mehbus kimini kiydim, putumgı kişenini silip, kamırgı solu etti. Bir yerde hem ayarlarının putları kişenlengen, tokuz adam yatıdığan karavatta otuz kırık adam kısılış bir atattık. Yaydığınımız bir tal Hıhtay Momisi bilen şogruş suyu. Biz de devamlı kolumuzu koyu silip, birşimizi karıhal tiki gizip, put kolumuzu tömür orunduğa mukumlaştırıp koyup, sonra kılattı. Mene tüncük ettim, sonra kalp çıkan vaxtı da putumuzu silingen kişen putumunu tıstıp, kantı etdi. Bir mezgildin ki, ben kişen silingen putumunu silap durup, bir çeri putum, ben üçün hücep mi bir cepat attım, eğer ben bu şehirden saksalama çıkıp gidersem, çokum sana bir yakışın nesi isip koymam deyip vedi verdim ve vedem de durup bunu yasattım. <gülüyor> Biz ne her günü kahırtan kış soğakta talada saatlap turguzup koyup kıynaydı. Kolumuz hiç kimine sezmesin, ağzımız kepki kemerdan bu kaga vaktte andan kamırga kırkzetti. Bu vaktte kamırdan temperatürsi talanık bilen oxşaş bogalıktın net saat kışlık esimiz ki kilemettik. İşkimen o yetenceli teyetenceyde biz barlak ayalani karvat kazancıda koydu. Ben jigir mi kazancılandım. Bu vaktte mana hemden eğer kegini numus buldu. 
Ben 10 gün geçerek köpçülükten aldı da hacet kılamay. 10. günü bilim bilen kusurum ve katkı ağırıp getkilerden tüncük ettim. Köpçülükten aldı da zıhlat durup hacet kıldım. Töt aydın ki yen <gülüyor> minan ceza lagırdaki atalmış ügünüş hayatım başlandı. Bir yerde hem ayalarının çaşları kısık kesitilgen, uyğur tılda sözüşümüz, dua kılış çeklengen. Hatta işki kolumuz bilen yüzümüzü yuş, iğızımızı itişini mu dua kılık teparlattı. Bu ceza lagırının hem yeri ki kamera oruntulgan bulup, bütün herkütümüzü küzdüp durattı. Biz 11 saatle Hıhtay'nın nüksansız, kanun, tarık, Hıhtay tili kızılnaş ögün ettik. Bizden bir günümüz Uluq Vatinimizde, Jungo Komünistik Partisi'ye, Xi Jinping'e rahmet etmiş bilen başlayıp, bulağa tülek tülek bilen ahırlış etdi. Bizde yılda işki kettin vaksin odi, bu vaksinden kiyin nurgulgan ayalarının asasiyatın adetler toxtap getdi. 2018 yılı 10 ayda bizni bir ayalığa bir saksın əmrə qıp durub, kolumuzu koyu silib, bişimizi karxal tıkı gizib, yerim keçidə yenidin silinğan cazalagırıqı yutkidi. Bir yada minin atalmış sotum içildi. Mağa, yolduşum ve işki kızımın Hıhtay noposunu üçe geldiğim üçün, vətendik uyumlu satkalıqım üçün, kızımın namayıştın tosup kalamıqalıqım üçün, Minin Hıhtay hükümetiki boğan sadaqtımının tövendiğini de Mağa 7 yıllık hüküm ilan kıldı. 2019 yılı 3. ayda Mən mini yanı bir kitim yut gidi. Bir yada mənden yaxşı yap, yaxşı işçip Tezrak əsliki kilişim tələb kılındı. Çünkü mən bəkli oruqlap 50 kilometre çıkmaydıqan bu kağıntım. Mən tüncü gittim Fransiyadaki ailemdikler bilen telefonda alaklaştım. Alaklı işitim burun saxçıla nimlani deyiş, nimlani demesliğim ne man ügetti. Mən şu saxçılarının digini bu içe cevap yer etdim. 8. ayda mən kızımın küş çıxırışı, ailemdiklerinin küş çıxırışı Fransiya hükümetinin diplomatik arlışı bilen Fransiyaya teşaman saxsalamet keli aldım. Esselamu Aleyküm, Hürmetlik, Hanımla, Efendiler. <gülüyor> Aldı bilen emanlarının kıymetlik vaxtıya rahmet eydim ben. Ben okutuşluk kəsbini tulumu yaxşı gör etdim. Ürümçü'de başlangıç mektepte 28 yıl Hıhtay tülü dersi de okutuşluk kıldım. 2017 yılı 3. ayda Hıhtay hükümetinden mecburluşu da körgen bilgenlerimini hiç yerde eğiz aşmaslık şartı bile 6 aylık toktamı imza koyup yeni bir mektepke ev edildim. Bu Saivak rayını tağ üstü kurulgan erler kamsı bulup İgiz tamlar elektronluk toklu kısımlar bile oralgan. Sakçılar ve küzetkücü aparatlar bütün yerini kaplıgan cahidi. Mini elektronluk dervazadın kırgızge vaxtı da ben bu cahide Katar tızlıgan her birilerinin korallarını bana tanılayıp durganlığını körüp intayın korkup gettim. Bütün vücudum titre etdi. Özlemli hudubur can meydanı kırıp kalandak his kalan idim. Sınıpta yüzge yakın tutkunlarının uçsudaki numur bislığan mahpus kıyımlarını kıyıp pakar küçük orunluklarda tügülüşüp oltır etdi. Hudume onlarını kutkuzgulu kegendek, közlerde lıq yaş, putkolları zencir kişilerden genelde mağa təlmür etdi. Aradın bir mezgül ütüp, bu cayğın nurğun yaş yigitler ve tutkun oğullar kilişki başladı. Komalğanlarının sani yetti mağa yetken idi. Her gün sınıfta yeni okuluşlar peyda bulatdı. Yarası sorakanda her içinişlik avazlar ve zoravallık avazlar anılınıp durattı. Bu içinişlik avazlar bütün binanı zırzılığı salattı. Onların kıynaşının usulü tört kıl bulup, elektronluk kaltek, elektronluk kalpak, elektronluk pelek ve elektronluk tümür orundukta onların kıynaydı. Onlar her vaxt tamıqa bir taldan Hıhtay momisi olan kuruq şögürüsü iş etdi. Mən onların ağırıqını his kılanmasıqa mümkün. Ama onbay mümuşu vəkşilikini, muşu dəbsancilikini öz gözümdü körüp tuğan bu oğaşka jürügüm katıq ağırıydı. Bütün vücudum titreydi. 
Közlerim yaş yukarı etti. Lekin ben yanılmış tarakı diyen o işçide yaş ettim. Bir günü ben küzüşü yüge elip kırıldım. Bu cayda çoğun bir ekranda bütün lagırlanan işçi ve kampalar küzüp durattı. Her bir kamırda 30'dan 40'e insanlar hiçbir çıra işbadesiz kuruk smotunun üstü de yetiş attı. Işık toluk etilmaydı. Ular kırıp çıkışta ömüleşke mecbur idi. Bu tutkunlarla münce giriş katı çeklenken bu başka, onların bedenleri pislap yetken idi. Bir gün bir herbi şundak dedi. Kara, Uygurlardan cennet nimdi gençin, biz onlarını aş koyduk, kıyınıduk, soğuk tuturdu. Ama onlar teki ölmedi. Öğüdük vaktimizde bizi daim yoklayıp durduğun, atalmış, hıhtay koşmak tutkan bar idi. O her ayda bir hafta üyemizge kelip bizi ile birle turattı. Ve Hıhtay hükümetinden beşte birli birli siyasetik asasen bizi ile birli tamak etetti, birli tamak yaydı, birli ügeniş kılattı, birli seyli kılattı, hatta ki birli yatattı. O daim fırsat tapsıla, sınıf birini kucaklayıp koyay, sınıf birini suyup koyay diye baktı da, minan bütün bedenim sürgünüp, hayatımdan cak tuyup git ettim. Köpünce Allah'da bu Hıhtay Ertuğallar Uyğur ayarlarının üyüge bilinetti. Uyğur ayarlar özlerinin üyü de depsençilik uçur etti. Bu Hıhtay Ertuğallar şu Uyğur ayarlarının üyü de her kıl şekilde özünün şu paydalık fırsatları bilen depsençilik kılattı. Uyğur ayarlarının erlerini ya kampılağı tutup getken veya ki mecbur emgek oranlarına ekitilgeler idi. Minun bu caydı ki, altı aylık toktumum ahırlaşıp, yeni bir yeni toktamga imza kuyuşka mecburlandım. Bu, ayalla kampsı idi. Bu cayda 10 mıngı yakın tutkun kız ayallar kamalgan bulup, onlarının yüzde 90 percenti 18 yaştın 40 yaş kıça idi. Tutkun kız ayallarının çaşları bütünleri çürütülgen, uçusta mekbuz kimi kiygen, közleri de lıh yaş. Kampıdan içinden çiğdik olsun ses bırakla kaptur attı. Bir günü bir tunuş sakçı ayal bana şundak dedi. Bu cayda Hıhtay er sakçılar tutkun kız ayalarını sonrak ceryanı da nöbetleşip baskınçılık kıldıklarını. Baskınçılık deyken kuludaki elektronluk kaltekle evlen tıkış arkalık kıynaş yapardıklarını eğitip verdi. Her hepte bu kız ayalığa namelun doğru iş güzletti. Okul ordu ve oladın kanal attı. Şunu bilen bu caydı ki kız ayarlarının umum yüzük adetleri toktap getken idi. Ben bir günü... Sorry. <gülüyor> ben bir günü... Şu cayda 18-20 yaşlık bir kızın cesedini şikayet bir zembilde aldım ben hep manga vakti de ben korkunum den nayeti özemli bu dünyada mevcut emes tek iskip ettim. Kallamda daim kızım dilini oylaydım. Közlerimdeki yeşimini yütü bitişke tırış attım. Şikim ben 18. yılı şikin cayda ben mecburi pensiyaya çıkarıldım. Şikim ben 19. yılı 5. cayda mecburi tuğması operasyası kılındım. Bu operasyon kılınan kündeki bu numusunu, bu dehşetini, bu kadar insanlık uğruk depsenli kılışını ben tılımda tesirle berişke <gülüyor> acizlik kılıma. Köp tırışçanlıkla bilen, şikimden 19. yılı 10. ayda Gollandiya'da kızımdan yanına kev aldım. Ben destepte Hıhtay'ın tehditinden korkup aşkarı kuvaklık beğenmedim. Bırak hiç sükü tutamaydım. Ben... Minin kitabım neşirden çıkan dinkiyen, Hıhtay hükümeti Bişimga terörçü edigen kalpağını kekizdi. Şükündün başlayıp, <coughs> Vettendeki barlıq uruk tıkalırım bilen boğan alakam üzüldü. Ben Deslep'te yeni çıkan vaxtımda, Vettende kalan yolduşum ve uruk tıkalırımını oylayıp, Çırayımını kösetmeyi mekbi alda kuvalıq bədim. Şikimban 20. yılı 6. aydın başlayıp, Gardiyan, BBC, CNN'de çok mertbatlar çıkartken deyken, vettende kalan tutkanlarım ve yolduşum Hıhtay hükümetinden basılış nişanı aylandı. Onlar yolduşumunu toktumayı sonra kılattı, kıyın kıstakı alattı. Hatta ki, benim kuvalıklarım yağına çıkış için yolduşumunu mecburi video işletip tarkattı. 
Şikimbağın jigerin birinci yıl ikinci ayının 18. günü yol düşümünü ekran arkalık içip mecbur halde beni arkalık ahanetlik sözler bilen acıraştırdı. İki ay burun ben akamdan sırlık ölümünün haber taptım. Zukan bilen doktoru hankırıp kalan akam bizden mengülük ayrılgan idi. Biz manmuşunda uruk tukalarımızın ayrılıp kavatımız. Veten bilen hiç kandak alakımız yok. Hıttay'nın erki kırgınçılıkı davamış batıdı. Bu her gizmi Hıttay hükümetinin ki halkımızın bir yolunu kırıp taşlaş için emez, belki asta asta bilindirme yoktuş için inçkilik bilen tüzülgen bir plan. Biz medeniyetimizden, tılımızdan, sanatımızdan ayrılıp kılıvatımız. Bunun için tekimi köp yoktuş işçi de yaşımız mümkün. Lekin biz tek hayat, vatan için, millet için ahirgıca küreş kılımız. <gülüyor> Bunu için, bunu için biz sizlerle bizimle birlikte buluşuyorlarını ve bizimle erkinlik, hak hukukumuz için küreş kılıbatkan, dünya uygur kuruldu, kişilik hukuk kuruluşu ile çoğun teşkilatlarını, kol dışınlarını ve sizlerle bir kişilik insanlık burcunlarını, adak dışınlarını ümit kılmayız. Biz fakat birlikte itibaklaşkanla tacavuz çıktı, hakimiyet üstü din, halip kilerleyemiz. Hemen Allah'a rahmet. I think we'll just. Oh. <laughs> Hello, I'll speak close to you. <laughs> oh wait, no, you're good. <laughs> Sorry. Hello, my name is Karine Kanimba, and um, I'm here because in 2020, my father, Paul Rusesa Begina. Uh, was kidnapped from our family home in Texas, in San Antonio, by the government of Rwanda. He was taken in a private jet, chartered directly by the Rwandan president, to Rwanda, where he was tortured, subjected to a sham trial, and convicted to 25 years in prison on completely fabricated charges. When my father was kidnapped, our family started a global advocacy campaign, engaging with governments uh, around the world, parliaments, human rights organizations, and individuals to help save our father's life. Little did we know that the Rwandan government was tracking our every move. The Amnesty Tech reached out to me, Amnesty International Tech, contacted me with um, the suspicions that I had been spied on. And at the Oslo Freedom Forum last year, I approached the Citizen Lab booth where John was working. So last year we ran a booth from a coat room out there. We're doing it again, so you should come by. Um, and we took a look at Corinne's device and the devices of the people who accompanied her, and we found a bunch more Pegasus. So when people are thinking about mercenary spyware, the question is always, what can it do? Well, the first thing you need to know is you're not going to see anything. If your device is infected with Pegasus spyware, it will just silently become a spy in your pocket. So let's talk about what it can do. Imagine a device infected with Pegasus. Well, the first thing is, of course, the operator can see who you're calling. They can listen to what you're saying. They can read even your encrypted chats. And of course, what are you talking about? They can track your location, figure out things like personal places, private meetings, professional meetings. They can look at what devices are nearby the phone. 
they can also look at other act activity. For example, who are you emailing? What are you saying? But also, how about your dating apps, right? And they can turn the phone into a bug in a room by enabling the microphones. They can also access your cloud files. Now, Pegasus is just one piece of this kind of spyware, but for the operators, you become a dot on a map surrounded by a lot of information about you, who you're interacting with, and where you're going. It's a pretty scary thing to be infected by this spyware, and it's why you should come get checked. As you can imagine, finding out that the same government that kidnapped my father, surveilled him for many years, tortured him, and jailed him, had now turned his gaze, his gaze on me and my family was a shock, and we were frightened. But we did not give up our advocacy campaign. We continued speaking out, and thanks to the help of the human rights community and all of you here, despite this attack, despite the kidnapping, despite the surveillance of my phone, after 939 days, two years and a half, my father, Paul Recessa Begina, was freed. After we told him about the Oslo Freedom Forum, my father wanted his first public message to be addressed to the Oslo community. So here is a video message from him. Hello, hello to everyone at the Oslo Freedom Forum. My name is Paul Rosset Sabagina. Today I am free man because of your voice and many like yours. It is my pleasure and honor to be addressing you. This time last year, I was in prison. You heard my story from my daughters who attended the Oslo Freedom Forum. All of you came together to advocate for my release and that of all political prisoners. And for me, you have succeeded. My freedom demonstrates that when you stand up for what you believe in, when you come together in a solidarity and are guided by the principles of human rights and democracy, you win. But we know that there is more work to do. We need your voice to continue to advocate in favor of these fundamental rights. We must ensure these principles are birthright of every individual, whether in Central Africa or well beyond. Thank you to the Human Rights Foundation for continuing to unite people across the globe in the struggle for a better world. I look forward to being by your side every step of the way. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now have a 30-minute intermission. Please return to your seats promptly.
idea is to bring together the most important, most significant figures in the human rights movement in one place. Too often human rights has become an issue for people at the UN or at major multilateral organizations. They focus much more on policies and laws. What we learn from history is that individuals are the ones that make the difference. remarkable is the perseverance of 15 years of storytelling. Stories, they link generations, humanity. This is why the Oslo Freedom Forum has become such an important place for freedom fighters from all over the world to meet. We're very, very different. But when we talk about the struggle for freedom, what we've lived as political prisoners or as activists in the streets or as exiles, the conversation is very familiar. These are parallel struggles against similar kinds of regimes. This is one of the places where they can learn about what can be effective in one part of the world, how it could be used in another place. I'm very happy that I can represent my country and the problems that it has from the stage of Oslo Freedom Forum. It feels so great to be surrounded by people who understand our struggle, who have ideas for you, who have solutions for you. There is an atmosphere here at the Oslo Freedom Forum. The way they share their stories, the way their talk is produced, truly can affect change for the better. I'm just a single person. By my own force, I cannot release millions of Uyghur people. But with you, with everyone, together, we make actions and together we make change. When I joined Oslo Freedom Forum, I was very excited. To be honest, I felt lonely before that. I'm being away from my family for 13 years. With Oslo Freedom Forum, I am not alone. There are many activists, politicians, journalists. There are many troublemakers like me, and I feel I am among my family. We don't just talk about the issues. We walk the talk. We show up for each other. There's people, a community. Many of us who have lost family or have lost friends, we have now a new family and new friends. Every time I speak to activists, they say that when they come here, it's like getting your battery recharged. I've met with an incredible number of very young, talented, committed, super strong activists. It um, gives me enough energy to carry me forward. It's dynamic. It's change-oriented. These are the kinds of friends that we know will be there in our time of need. Why you see cheerful people? Why you see smiles in the faces of people here? Because we are optimistic about our fight. And part of that optimism is understanding that we are not alone. And that's the magic of the Arsenal Freedom Forum. Good afternoon. So the video you just watched, uh, I hope, helped you to grasp the spirit of Oslo Freedom Forum. Um, it's a brainchild of my dear friend, Thor Halverson, and it's a 15th event here. And of course, I'm very happy to be here in Oslo and to meet my old friends and also newcomers, those who are joining uh, this family, family of uh, freedom fighters, of human rights activists from every quarter of the world stretching from North Korea to Nicaragua and from Belarus to Zimbabwe. And um, speaking about the dreams and hopes, and I believe that's the inspiration comes from all the stories, no matter how dark the stories, how cruel uh, the torture uh, and, the, and, and uh, actions of, of the uh, evil. Um, I wanted also for a moment, for a few, few minutes, not to wear a hat of a chairman of Human Rights Foundation, but to become again a political activist and to tell my own story. Um, it's a story of a pin that is on my lapel, and I'm being asked all the time what it is. Uh, it's um, also 
a pin that represents dreams and hopes. And before I explain, just I want to share my own flag story that goes all the way back to 1990. Uh, I played chess for, for a while, and that's, that's a picture of my fifth and the last match against Anatoly Karpov, the darling of Soviet system. We played in New York and Lyon. The match was split in two. And uh, as you remember, in 1999, the Soviet Union was going down, and I, I was a young 27-year-old uh, activist who wanted to make a change. And all I could do at the time is just to demonstrate my protest by refusing to play under the Soviet flag. And I was the first Soviet athlete who refused to play under the Soviet flag and demanded, instead of the uh, Soviet uh, red flag with hammer and sickle, to have the old Russian tricolor, uh, which was, of course, quite a sensation at the time. And uh, I remember that my mother spent the whole night trying to, to, to, to, to make it out of the strips of ribbon and, and, and a little stick that's all put together by glue. And, uh, and I have to say that the, the, when I showed up in, in, in, in, uh, uh, next morning uh, in one of the American uh, morning shows, uh, the uh, anchor woman, she was quite you know, knowledgeable, and she asked what I, why I was bringing with me a flag of Luxembourg. <laughs> that's the closest she could get it. Uh, and uh, I had to explain what it is. Um, and uh, at, at that time, it was a flag of the protest. And of course, Karpov immediately demanded the flag to be removed. I managed to stick it out to my flag uh, for, four, for four games. Eventually, FIDE, International Chess Federation, made a, a Solomon decision by, to remove both flags, which means I won. There was no, no, no, there was no Soviet flag uh, uh, on the table. And I wore uh, the pin with Russian tricolor. That was back in 1990. Today, this is a flag that represents terror, murder, war, corruption. And again, that's probably destiny. So I, I'm one of many of my friends who is now wearing what we believe will be a new Russian flag. And the, the idea behind this new flag is, is fairly simple. We believe we have to wash the blood, the color of blood from Russian flag. There should be no more red on our flag for the future. That's the flag that hopefully will give us a chance to start afresh. Um, and uh, you could see that Russians all across the world, from Baltic states to San Francisco, they are wearing this flag, protesting against the war, again, in hopes that we will have a new start, a fresh start in, in, in uh, our country. Uh, we call it uh, white, uh, uh, blue, white. Don't mix this with Nicaraguan, uh, uh, blue, white, blue. Uh, or with Finnish or with many other countries that, that have these colors. Uh, in Russian, it's Bela Sini Bela Bela And we believe that that will be a flag of new, new Russia that will be part of, again, part of the family of civilized nations. But before it happens, we all know Ukraine must win. And uh, this is and this is the flag that brings the freedom to, to, to the world. And I always say that the beginning of liberation of Russia from Putin's fascism will not start before Ukrainian flag will be raised in Sevastopol. And um, this is this order of moves you cannot change. And uh, and I uh, understand that, it's, uh, that we all share this, this sentiment, that the war that is happening as we speak now, it's not just a war to restore territorial integrity of Ukraine. This is the real front line of the never-ending battle between freedom and tyranny. And Ukrainians paying the highest price in blood for their freedom and for our freedom. And it gives me just it's a great sense of honor to uh, invite uh, the member of Euro Ukrainian parliament, Lizzie Yeska, to talk about Ukraine, to have Ukrainian voice from this stage, to give us inspiration and to share their heroism and de devotion to our freedom. Slava Ukraini!
Good afternoon to everyone. And I know that you might have a question. Why should you support Ukraine more and more? And I will tell you why. This was me nearly 10 years ago. A young girl playing at the barricades of Euromaidan between protesters and the police. A young girl in love with freedom and being very honest to my purpose. I want to do everything possible to live in a free, democratic, European Ukraine. I belong to a generation of independent Ukrainians, those who have never seen Soviet Union, and we were raised with yellow-blue colors of freedom that is not taken for granted. And everything that I have in my life, I have because of my hard work and also because of being true to my purpose. No matter what I was doing, studying in the best universities, fundraising for my scholarships, working on governmental campaigns to support Ukraine, cultural diplomacy campaigns, uh, filmmaking documentaries about Ukraine, or becoming a member of the parliament, I know that I'm in the right place because I serve the mission to build a free, democratic, future, European future of my country. Ukraine is a country of unique opportunities, of very hard-working people, of good education, of digitalization. We are the country of people who know what bravery is, what courage is. If we don't like something, we take responsibility and we change it. And it's not only in our home or it's in our work, it's in the history we make. And here you see our people without weapon being able to stop Russian tanks. You also see here our farmers keep working with the land while being under the fire. You see me here, a young girl, a woman, but in fact, I'm not unique. I'm certainly not special. I'm not special in my love for freedom. I'm just one of millions of Ukrainians, men and women, husbands and wives, sons and daughters, being in love with freedom and doing everything possible to defend our right to live in freedom. And now, I want you to ask to close your eyes and imagine a world where the birds have stopped singing, where you come to your house, but it no longer exists. When the whole farm is flooded, and every animal in the local zoo is dead. When your child goes to a school, but there is no school anymore. Where your children can't play in the park because of the landmines. And the only thing you can hear is this. And when you open your eyes, it's 24th of February, the day when the war has started for majority of Ukrainians, but not for me. For me, it started nearly six months before that, when my soulmate, my partner, the former president of Georgia, Mikhail Saakashvili, the first ever political leader who opposed Putin, who opposed Russian invasion of Georgia, was arrested on illegal 
political ground of political persecution, political revenge, on his way from Ukraine to Georgia. Until then, we lived as a happy family, full of plans, me, ambitious young woman, being very active in Ukraine parliament, young politician, him having so much experience in politics, being very active, but more importantly, we were expecting a child. For Mikhail and I, we were dreaming how we would be walking together with our child in our garden of grapes and roses in our house at the outskirts of Kyiv, where we used to live. In the same house, I woke up on the 24th of February, alone, to the sound of explosions. A close friend came in saying, Lisa, wake up, the war has started. The same friend would be wounded later near Bakhmut. But at that time, at 4 a.m., he was helping me to get to the parliament so that I could vote for the martial law and to mobilize society. Since then, so many days have passed. So many broken houses, broken destinies, lives, relationships. And now, I am a mother of Ukrainian child. And the childhood of my child is far from the dream we were imagining. She's being raised by only one parent, by me, her mother. One day, she will know how much her father, who opposed Russian invasion for his active, brave stand against Putin, had to go through physical, psychological harm, how many days he has to spend in prison. One day, she would know how much of physical risks, harassment, her mother, me, had to go through while visiting him in prison and defending him while being pregnant. One day, she would know what is the real price we all pay. My child, together with thousands of Ukrainian children, are currently knowing that there is a war at home, that it's not safe, and they are being raised by only one parent, by us, Ukrainian mothers, Ukrainian women. And we don't have a choice. When we feel alone, when we don't sleep at night, when our house is bombed, we know what we must do. We have to stand up to fight to protect our children. We have to do everything possible to protect their right to live in freedom. My colleague in parliament has lost her husband, the father of her two children. And she is now alone with two children, but keeps her active work in Ukraine parliament. Why should you support Ukraine? Because we want to live on our soil together with our families. And why should you support Ukraine? Because it's not only about Ukraine. It's about no matter where you live, in Norway, Denmark, Germany, US, Georgia, your choice to support Ukraine shapes your future in freedom too, together with your families. And yes, I'm asking more specifically for imposing more sanctions on behalf of your countries to restrict Russian aggression. Yes, I'm asking for more weapons, jets, because weapons is as important as food for us in our daily life to defend it. 
Yes, I'm asking for Ukraine recovery, assistance. We need it a lot. And I'm also asking you, on behalf of your organizations, your countries, stand up to help us to release our political prisoners who oppose Putin, those who speak the truth, help us to get our prisoners of war back. And here's something that you can do more specifically now. You can help to raise funds for the educational fund for Ukrainian children pursuing arts and science activities during the war. Because we need to make sure that our children receive good education with well-being and positivity, and we need it right now. Why should you support Ukraine? Because if you care about freedom, then stand with Ukraine. If you care about the food security of the world, if you care about European security, then stand with Ukraine. If you care about the family, then stand with Ukraine. If you care about the future of your own, then stand with ours. Why should you support Ukraine? because we want to live. Thank you. Thank you. Don't forget to stand for freedom no matter where you are. It's very important for our future. Thank you. Thank you. I'm coming from Iran, a country where a female-led revolution is still burning. The revolution is called Woman Life Freedom. But you all remember, last year, the unity and solidarity between Iranian people and all of you helped us to get the attention of the democratic countries. The leaders in the West were cutting their hair. But today I'm here to tell you that they didn't cut their ties with the murderers, with the killers. I want to ask a simple question here. How many of you are the victim of oppressive regime in your own country? Hands up. How many of you managed to meet with the leaders of democratic countries? A few of us. And I want to tell you, today we are here, we are talking about these oppressive regimes from China to Russia to Venezuela to Iran, Zimbabwe, Nicaragua, everywhere. The representative of Taliban is here in Oslo and meeting with the policymakers. How ironic. Last year, women got killed in Iran. Women got kicked out from university in Afghanistan. But Islamic Republic being pointed out at the Vice President of General Assembly at the United Nations. So you see, United Nations is good at uniting dictators. Yes. And last year, two years ago, I met with Leopoldo Lopez, with Gary Kasparov, here at Oslo Freedom, and we realized that dictators are helping each other. And that's why. They can oppress us, and they can get the attention of the democratic leaders. We realize that we have to be united as well. With your help, all dissidents from autocracy and dictatorship, we created World Liberty Congress to be united. Please, don't get me wrong, but we are fed up at sitting here and talking about misery, sorrow, torture, being in prison, getting killed, 
time has come that we commit to have a global rally against dictators. We have to take to the streets. Agree with me? Then we have to be united. Next time, we're going to have a global revolution against Putin, against Maduro, against Khamenei and his gang of killer across the globe. We need to have a women's march for women of Iran and Afghanistan. We commit to have a global and world rally everywhere against all dictators. These are the only way that we can win together. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> So as we speak, Raisi, the president of Iran, is in Caracas, Venezuela, meeting with Maduro, as we speak. Three weeks ago, Lavrov, the foreign minister of Russia, representative of Putin, in the middle of the war, was in Caracas, meeting with Maduro. Then they went to Nicaragua and to Cuba to secure their foothold in the Americas. They've been doing the same in Africa. They've been doing the same in Asia with China. They are working together. They are expanding their model of autocracy. It's not ideology, because you have the mullahs from Iran, conservatives, to the, to the Communist Party from China. It's not about ideology, it's about power, it's about autocracy. And it's about, as they said yesterday in Caracas, it's about going against their enemies. And part of what they identify as their enemies, not only the United States or liberal democracy as a model, is what they call the color revolutions. And the color revolutions is what many of us represent. Are the revolutions, the movements against autocratic regimes. So they are against all of us in each one of our countries. So as Masi said, we decided to come together, all of us, from all of autocratic regimes. And we created with many people more than 200 activists from all over the world, the World Liberty Congress. We met for the first time last year in Lithuania. 44 countries were represented. During the first day, we heard those 44 delegations, 44 stories with different accents, different religions, different skin color, different institutions, different climate. But it was, at the end of the day, only one story. The story of those who fight for freedom. The story of those who are willing to take risks for freedom. And that's what we are doing with the World Liberty Congress. Coming together, joining efforts, working together with specific plans, being action-oriented. But something more important, becoming friends. Friends in freedom. Brothers and sisters with the same cause. Because what we are hearing here today is that these values, human rights, are universal. No boundaries. The violation of human rights anywhere is a violation of human rights everywhere. So that is why we will continue. And this November, we will meet again to continue to grow, to strengthen our network, and to do action for freedom. And we ask all of you to become part of this global movement for freedom with hope and with enthusiasm with those who know that are in the right side of the history in fighting for freedom in the world. So we commend you to work with us, to work together in a common fight, in a common struggle for freedom. Thank you. Um, it's very difficult to speak after these two passionate <laughs> appeals. Um, just you know, to summarize it, uh, here at Oslo Freedom Forum, you hear this year and years before stories. Uh, and, uh, and these stories, they, they inspire us to fight. Um, but what is very important is now that as we turn these stories into action, we have to weaponize dreams and hopes uh, to make them just uh, real tools to recover freedom. Because the freedom cannot be separated. Uh, we are here, and uh, we talked about, about cooperation of dictators. Yeah, we are here when Iranian drones are killing Ukrainians by, by, using, by being used by, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, by Putin troops. So they know how to work together. So we decided we have to counter them. And by the way, we have to remind the world that we are not a minority, we are not victims. We are a majority and we should be the winners. 
how many times you hear you know, on television, oh, the story is not that clear. Yes, it's the free world. West supports Ukraine. Now, maybe Japan, Australia. So, but the rest, global south, oh, they're not, they're not so sure. They're not African countries who are supporting Vladimir Putin. They're African dictators. And the true representatives of African countries are sitting here. It's the behind every, behind every call for the so-called ceasefire in Ukraine and, you know, some direct or indirect support for Putin, you find an interest of corrupt dictatorship. So that's why we have to fight together because either we'll lose together or we'll win together. And I believe we are on the right side of history and it's time for us to become winners. Thank you. I had an amazing childhood growing up. I was raised by a hardworking single mom. Hi, mom. <laughs> On the weekends, she would take me to the hotel where she worked, and I got to play around, swim in the pool, eat that fancy hotel food. You know? Unfortunately, this wouldn't last very long. When I was about seven years old, my mom sat me down, told me she was going to the UK for work. At that age, I couldn't really comprehend that. I was seven years after all, right? and I thought she was abandoning me. It wasn't until I got to my mid-twenties that I understood why she had left. She had migrated to the UK in search of a better life for both me and her. In my mid-twenties, I was in a really bad place, financially, mentally. I was struggling with all sorts of things. I was battling all sorts of demons, and all I wanted to do was just get out of that environment and start over. I had a friend who was working in Dubai at the time, he had known me ever since I was about this tall, really young. We met during his vacation, and during the intervention, which it was, he introduced me to the idea of migration. He had a stable income, he had savings in the bank, he took care of his mom, he, he was living abroad. Basically everything that I wanted, right? So it, he urged me to try it out, so I did. The following week, we went to a recruitment agency that sends migrant workers to the Gulf. I was in no position to choose jobs, as I really hadn't performed well in school. The only job options available were minimum wage, security, cleaning, gardening, construction. I said I'd take the first one that came along, which just happened to be security. The salary was $400. This was more money than I ever thought I'd earn, right? But I had to pay about $1,200 to facilitate the whole process. This was illegal, and, and two, I didn't have $1,200. Luckily, my mom came to the rescue and you know, paid everything, and on January 2016, I flew out and told myself I'm never coming back. Now, I've worked in Qatar for about four years, give or take, under two different companies. The first company, things are good, normal, Wages, living conditions, working conditions, everything was pretty much compliant with the law. The second company, this is where things get interesting. Okay? We arrive in Qatar, our passports are taken, which is illegal. 
the working hours, they are longer than stated in the original contract. The living conditions, goodness. Imagine living six, eight, 10, 12 people in one tiny room. It was pretty cramped. We had bed bugs everywhere. There was mold on the wall everywhere. It was atrocious conditions, really. Bathrooms, toilets, they were unsanitary. And the food was appalling. People even got sick because of this company provided food. So I said I'd do something about it. Not because I was brave. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. It was because I'd had enough. There's only so much a person can take, right? So for context, our company provided security for Msherib downtown Doha. Smart, sustainable city, da da da. Msherib downtown Doha is or was the flagship project of Msherib Properties. Msherib Properties is a subsidiary of Qatar Foundation, yes, the one and only. Qatar Foundation has this mandatory welfare standards that dictate the living conditions, the working conditions, and even recruitment of migrant workers. So I did some digging and found that none of these conditions were being implemented in our company. So I wrote an anonymous letter to Mshare Properties, Qatar Foundation, the Ministry of Labor, and even the Ministry of Interior, but to no avail. It was never my intention to, to go public, right? I was working from behind the shadows using an anonymous you know, name and all that. Never my intention to go public. But seeing as how these institutions basically did nothing you know, in light of these conditions, I reached out to migrantrights.org, and they helped me write an article where I describe the injustices and the various stories of individual guards. The article got a lot of traction, unbelievably, right? Our company was forced to implement some of these welfare standards and changes to our living conditions. This was unprecedented. Something like this had never happened before. So it was a, it was a victory, right? You know, light bulb moment. So you mean to tell me that all I needed to do for things to change is just to write? To express myself? Roger that. So Migrant Rights gave me a platform where I would blog about various topics. And I also had my Twitter and Instagram where I would post regularly. Allow me to introduce you to Sheikha Moza bint Nasser, Her Highness. According to the internet, she is a humanitarian who is also responsible for major reforms in education and women's rights in Qatar. She also happens to be the mother to the king, or the emir, by the way. So how does she fall into all this story? Well, it was the summer of 2020. She happens to have an office in the same place that I work, that is Mshave downtown Doha. She visits this office once a week. So one day, 10 a.m., she pulls up in a long Bentley, right? Maroon in color, never forget that. She sees security guards will be made to stand outside since morning. For those of you who are not aware, it gets really hot in Qatar. Temperatures exceeding 50 degrees, we're talking humidity off the charts. Right? It gets so hot that the government actually prohibits anyone from walking outside from around 10 a.m. to around 3 p.m. So it's basically legal, yet here we are. She sees the security guards, does nothing to address the issue. As the chairperson and co-founder of Qatar Foundation, as a humanitarian, as an individual with substantial influence. The least she could have done is just notify the relevant department, but she didn't. This goes on for the rest of the summer, and no one does anything about anything. Fast forward to the next year, this is March 2021, right before summer, and I knew we were going to have a repeat of what happened in the previous year. So. I said, I'm going to do something about it. Again, not because I'm brave, but because it was necessary, okay? So I write an article detailing what happened the previous year, and I follow it up with an Instagram series on the stories of individual guards within the property. This got substantial traction, and as a result, we had some changes. Security guards were no longer made to stand outside during these wicked temperature times, and 
they were given regular breaks, they were given drinking water, none of which was available in the previous year. It was a victory again. A small victory, but a victory nonetheless. About a month later, on May 4th, I got arrested by the State Security Bureau, or the SSB. They told me I wasn't entitled to legal counsel. They placed me in, in solitary confinement. So it was four weeks of interrogation, blindfolds, handcuffs, trips back and forth in blacked out SUVs to the public prosecution without a lawyer. Psychological tactics, disorientation, you name it, right? I was made to sign a confession in Arabic, basically stating that I had received money from foreign agents with the intent to spread disinformation in the state of Qatar. Yeah, that's a mouthful, but all it really means is I was being charged under the Espionage Act, which is a really, really bad thing to be charged with in any of those Gulf countries, right? Fortunately, my disappearance prompted international outcry. Students from Qatar Foundation, together with alumni, faculty, and staff, they wrote a letter calling for my release. This, honestly, was the best thing that happened during this period. To all those students, faculty, staff, alumni from Qatar Foundation, thank you. A civil society group stepped in and provided a lawyer. And through negotiations, the espionage charge was taken off the table, right? But I wasn't still allowed to leave the country. I had to pay a fine, I had to pay a fine of about $6,800. You know, then I was free to leave. No? Now, moving forward, together with all those experiences, right, we would like to focus on an issue that isn't really talked about, and this is the reintegration of migrant workers back to society. After my ordeal, I was fortunate to have not one, but multiple organizations support me. I was picked up at the airport. I was offered a living arrangement. They offered counseling. I even got a six-month consultancy with a certain NGO. Most migrant workers don't have that. I have a vision of, of this center, a center for migrant worker welfare, a center where other migrant workers who've been exposed to traumatic experiences could also be afforded the same courtesy. And through partnerships with various institutions, we could offer training in various fields, various trades, so that they could become employed or self-employed. Last year, during the 2022 World Cup in Qatar, the world was introduced to the sad reality, the harsh reality of migrant workers in the Gulf. Modern slavery, human trafficking, forced labor, the deaths, There were calls for boycott, and a lot of you wanted to know how you can help. It's not enough to write articles. It's not enough to write those reports. It's not enough to shoot documentaries. We need to do more. Here's what more looks like. Airplane tickets cost money. The living arrangement costs money. Research, counseling, medical care, all of this costs money. We need funding for this. We need pro bono legal assistance. We need digital security and tech support to coordinate these operations, right? With such a system in place, with such a center in place, we show that there is hope for life after migration. Thank you. Fighting against dictatorship can often feel extremely lonely. Having the capacity to build new alliances, showing solidarity to one another even if we come from different backgrounds, this will be the exact reason why dictatorships will fall.
The Freedom Fellowship is a unique program that gives activists that are fighting for democracy or human rights special mentorship on eight different areas, teaching strong leadership while at the same time decentralizing it and allowing other leaders to emerge within their movements. Nonviolent action and movement building is identifying the sources of oppression in society and figuring out how to mobilize people effectively against it. Nonviolent movements are the best tool we have to actually turn down a dictatorship by building democracy. Once a movement achieves the end of an oppressive system, it needs to also prepare for a democratic transition. What are the role of civil society leaders and movements during a transition towards democracy once the dictator has left the head of state? Narrative is what takes you from an idea to a sustained identity and a concrete vision of tomorrow that transcends the existence of a dictatorship in your country. To be able to craft our narrative and make it accessible for more people, that's the deciding factor in whether or not truth overcomes the narrative of propaganda by authoritarian regimes. Visibility for human rights causes can mean the difference between a dictatorship continuing to repress or holding back. It's really important that these activists can tell the story in their way, on their terms, teaching them how to interview correctly with press to make sure that their story can get elevated and, and can resonate across the world. One of the things the Freedom Fellows focus on is digital security, communication security, so things like VPNs, staying safe on the internet, making sure the government can't see what they're doing. The other component is financial security. These folks are often in a situation where they don't have a bank account or their bank account got frozen or it's being surveilled. We teach them how to use Bitcoin and we teach them how to use Bitcoin as safely as possible. Before this, we never got that kind of idea of how to use this kind of technology in our movement. Thanks to HRF and the Freedom Fellows, like we were able to learn about this. Discussing finances is a very difficult conversation among activists. A lot of us don't have a, a great understanding on how to go about that. It takes a different set of skills to fundraise when you are being persecuted by a dictatorship we help with, how to get in front of somebody, how to ask for money, who to ask for money, what to ask for money for. So that activists can have a sustainable source of resources while they continue doing their work. Mental health taps into the resources that they have inside to be able to deal with what happens outside. We have very specific trainings, not only in understanding the nervous system and how to regulate it, but what trauma is and how it affects the individual and communities. And we also have a mental health expert that is working with the fellows. To keep going and not break and not collapse and not burn out. We are doing what I think is the future of human rights work, supporting the people that will actually halt the trend of authoritarianism around the world by defeating dictators and bringing democratic processes to their countries. What's different here is that it's really an ongoing interaction, a really powerful network. It's the sharing of wisdom and insight. I invite you to be part of the global movement for democracy by supporting the Freedom Fellowship. Years ago, I attended the Oslo Freedom Forum as an activist participating in a pilot program, the Freedom Fellowship. At that time, the fellowship had only one mentor, Mr. Serja Popovich, nonviolence expert and Canvas executive director. And only one participant, Janice Vakadaza from Bolivia. <laughs> it was a pilot program, we had no idea if it was going to be a success, but now, five years later, I'm very happy to tell you that I am the Freedom Fellowship Manager for the Human Rights Foundation. This program has supported over 45 activists from different autocratic regimes around the world, and now we have 12 mentors that support the fellows all year around. This has been made possible because of the wonderful community of the Also Freedom Forum. And as the fellowship continues to grow, we need the support of each of you. 
This is where I take over? Okay. Thank you, Janice. It's great to be here. Thank you for helping us grow year after year after year. And this is a marvelous proliferation of what we in Canvas really believe into, that yes, enemies are different, contexts are different, conflicts are different, yeah. but it is the skills that matter. So investing in skills of people fighting for freedom is what we are really up to. And as some of you will figure out, I just figured out in a corridor, this is my tent here in Oslo Freedom Forum. This grows into beyond work, into some kind of family, and families, yeah. we support each other. So this is a place for me to call for your support, starting with coming to 415 session, where you will see our new cohort of Freedom Fellows, they're in a little sale. If you're from activist community, you can connect, you can share your skills, you can mm -hmm. learn from our uh, Freedom Fellows. If you're coming from donor community, international organizations, you can chip in some money and support them. They really need that. Lastly, we are developing the program with University of Virginia, so if you're more into academic research, that also matters. Before all, thank you for being here, thank you for being part of the family, and as we usually say, freedom is not for free, but it's very often worth fighting for. See you in a bit. Thank you. If someone came up with the idea of cash today, it would be immediately banned. Cash is an amazing tool for privacy, for freedom, for activism, but it's being attacked. Today we really have two kinds of money. Public money, that's a liability of the central bank, and then money created by the banking system in the private sector. A central bank digital currency is a direct liability of a central bank, and it allows the government total control. The digital yuan is issued by the central bank, just like paper notes, tied to the Chinese government. What people don't realize is they're a massive human rights issue. All kinds of digital transactions are controlled, surveilled, monitored, blacklisted. A key difference with the CBDC is that central bank will have absolute control that will determine the use, and also we will have the technology to enforce that. There's already several hundred million people in China that are using or have exposure to these CBDCs. Digital Yuan is meant to allow the government to keep an eye on money flows. It can also be programmed, for example, to expire to encourage people to spend. There are authoritarian regimes pushing these things, and a lot of them are, are moving towards a rapid deployment phase. The CBDC Tracker is a new project from the Human Rights Foundation. It stands for Central Bank Digital Currency Tracker. It's going to be an online resource that describes the progress of central bank digital currencies around the world, especially in authoritarian countries, and the civil liberties, red flags, and risks that come along with this. It'll be a resource for policymakers, journalists, the general public, and it'll be out at the end of the year. The next talk will be interpreted from the Spanish language. Please raise your hand if you require a headset, and one will be brought to you in your seat.
hasta el 23 de enero, hasta el 23 de enero de 2018, era un estudiante universitario que hacía trabajo social. Tenía una organización en la que trabajábamos por la reinserción social de jóvenes que después de las protestas habían quedado en situación de calle. En Venezuela, ofrecer oportunidades puede ser considerado un crimen. Es por eso que la dictadura de Nicolás Maduro me impuso la tortura como castigo por hacer trabajo social. Pasé de ser un estudiante universitario, un trabajador social, y ellos me convirtieron en un preso político cuando me detuvieron ilegal y arbitrariamente. Fueron varios días los que duré desaparecido. Mientras estaba desaparecido le decían a mi mamá que me buscara en la morgue. No me permitieron una llamada, no me permitieron una visita, no permitieron que yo tuviese un abogado. Me detuvo el SEBIN, el Servicio Bolivariano de Inteligencia Nacional, una de las tantas policías políticas que obedecen a las órdenes directas de Nicolás Maduro Moros. Fueron cinco largos meses en el helicoide, el centro de torturas más grande de América Latina. La semana pasada se cumplieron cinco años desde que salía el helicoide. Sin embargo, hoy todavía me cuestiono quién soy. ¿Quién es Víctor Navarro? Ahí... Hay noches de angustia y de terror en las que esta pregunta me hace temer por mi vida. Desorientado me pregunto si como aquella vez van a volver los 35 oficiales de la policía política, todos vestidos de negro, con la cara tapada, con armas largas, a tumbar la puerta de mi casa a las cuatro y media de la madrugada. ¿Quién es Víctor Navarro? Preguntaban una y otra vez mientras me tenían de rodillas. Esa pregunta no me deja dormir porque como una montaña rusa viene el recuerdo del oficial metiéndome un arma en la boca exigiéndome que le pidiera perdón. No puedo dormir porque recuerdo cómo asfixiaban a Anderson con una bolsa en la cara y yo no podía hacer nada. O vuelve el sonido de mujeres que están siendo violadas una mujer siendo violada por dos o tres oficiales u hombres cuya corriente está siendo anexada a sus testículos. La deshumanización que hay en la tortura es imposible de explicar en palabras. Pero comienza con una pregunta muy básica. ¿Quién eres? En mi caso, ¿quién es Víctor Navarro? Para mi mamá, yo era el orgullo de la familia, el primero de sus cinco hijos en graduarse de la universidad, a pesar de haber crecido en un contexto violento. Para mi abuela, en cambio, yo me había convertido en el hombre de la casa. Me había convertido en el hombre de la casa porque mi papá lo mataron mientras la capital de mi país era una de las ciudades más peligrosas del mundo bajo el gobierno de Hugo Chávez. Para mis hermanas, yo era un ejemplo a seguir. Y para mis amigos era el alma de la fiesta. Yo me veía como un líder comunitario que ofrecía oportunidades a los jóvenes de su barrio. Sin embargo, para el régimen de mi país yo no era nada de eso. Yo era el 25-510-806. Mi deshumanización comenzó cuando el régimen de Nicolás Maduro estableció que Víctor Navarro era un terrorista identificado con el número 25-510-806. El régimen opresor busca deshumanizarte para facilitar la tortura física o psicológica. Es imposible explicar cómo puedes seguir viviendo después de que te hacen sentir una no persona. ¿Cómo explico que duré 129 días sin ver el sol? ¿Cómo explico que me es doloroso escribir una carta 
o que después que salía el helicoide, la lluvia o, o el tamaño de los edificios eran abrumadores para mí. ¿Cómo se explica que es doloroso recordar cómo torturaban a tu compañero de celda? Porque la peor tortura es la tortura de los otros. ¿Cómo le explico a la gente que todavía no son libres? Es difícil revivir todas estas experiencias, contarlo, enfrentarnos a esto, a este público, pero es una necesidad que ustedes sepan y vean cómo vive un preso político, que conozcan y reconozcan lo que representa que te despojen de tu libertad. Es por eso que esta necesidad me llevó a mí y a mis 29 compañeros, a 29 compañeros que estuvimos ilegal y arbitrariamente detenidos en el helicoide, a crear una experiencia en realidad virtual para que ustedes puedan ver lo que está sucediendo en este momento en Venezuela. Creamos una experiencia inmersiva para que vean cómo Maduro tortura sistemáticamente Está aquí, ustedes van a poder verla. Fíjense, la Misión Independiente de Determinación de Hechos de las Naciones Unidas está investigando al régimen venezolano por crímenes de lesa humanidad establecidos desde el año 2014 en contra del pueblo venezolano. Crímenes de lesa humanidad. El 30 de junio de 2022, Nicolás Maduro le prohibió a las Naciones Unidas la entrada al helicoide. La dictadura de Nicolás Maduro no quiere que el mundo sepa lo que pasa en el helicóptero y en los centros de tortura que hay en Venezuela. Nosotros hicimos esta experiencia porque no solo creemos en la tecnología como una herramienta para explicar aquello que es inexplicable en palabras. Hicimos esta herramienta para que el mundo vea lo que Maduro no quiere que la gente sepa. Para nosotros este proyecto ha representado un instrumento de lucha. Si Maduro tortura sistemáticamente, nosotros vamos a denunciar y contar historias de manera sistemática. Los regímenes autocráticos se alimentan del miedo, lo fortalece el silencio. No nos vamos a callar. Estamos aquí para alzar la voz por aquellos que no pueden ser escuchados porque están siendo torturados en Venezuela. Estamos aquí porque los crímenes de lesa humanidad que comete Maduro no son solo contra los venezolanos, son contra la humanidad. Yo estoy aquí porque sobreviví y porque quiero que sepan lo que esto representa para mí y para mis 29 compañeros. Quiero que sepan lo que representa para los casi 16.000 presos políticos que ha habido en Venezuela desde el año 2014. Pero principalmente para los casi 300 presos políticos que Maduro tiene en un centro de tortura en Venezuela. El día que salía el helicoide, yo pensaba que la libertad era un privilegio. Con el tiempo me he dado cuenta que no. La libertad es un derecho humano. Nuestra lucha es por defender la libertad y la dignidad humana. Nuestra lucha es para que cierren el helicoide y todos los centros de tortura que hay en el mundo. Porque esto no solo pasa en Venezuela. Esto pasa en Cuba, en Nicaragua, en Rusia, en Bielorrusia, en Siria, en Sudán y en todos los países donde la tortura, la persecución, la detención arbitraria, el asesinato, son una política de Estado. Hay noches en las que me pregunto quién es Víctor Navarro. Y la verdad es que no tengo la menor idea. Pero sí sé algo. Yo no soy un terrorista. Tampoco soy el 25-510-806. Yo soy la humanidad que me despojaron. 
Yo soy lo que mi familia y mis amigos piensan de mí. Yo soy una historia incompleta, pero sobre todo soy lo que decido hacer con lo que viví. No nos vamos a callar. Yo no soy un número. Yo soy Víctor Navarro. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Gracias. Gracias. A week ago, my mother died. I got the call. She had fallen and hit her head. So I'm experiencing a lot of pain and sadness right now. I have two choices on how I deal with my pain and sadness. The first choice is I call it resistance. It's my word. And classic forms of resistance are alcohol, <laughs> food, going numb. Not so classic forms of resistance that may surprise you that are explicitly taught are replacing my sadness with calm, letting it go, rationalizing it away. Conversely, the other choice I have is intimacy with my sadness, using it to connect to compassion for myself and express love for my mother. Switching to a different emotion, primary emotion, let's now talk about fear or anxiety, which is what everybody's calling it these days, which is another name for fear. It's exactly the same thing. Why do we need to talk about fear? Because it's a big, hairy deal. We like to think that we're all about love, and we are, but we're also all about fear. Why? Because we have this oldest part of our brain, the amygdala. All data comes through this primary filter first, where it determines in a flash if there's a threat, it'll send a shot of discomfort called fear that's supposed to flow through our bodies like water through a hose, provide for us on-point intuitive, intuitive physical reaction all in a moment without thought. It's a miracle. What do I mean by fear? Do I mean scared or afraid? It rarely manifests as scared or afraid. Just know when I talk fear, I mean any kind of sensation of discomfort in our bodies. It comes from three primary resources. Everyday life, work, school, coming in contact with difficult people. In fact, everyday life fear is such a big deal that fear is with us from this every moment of every day. We don't even need to leave our house and it's there. It also comes from others. Trauma, abuse, using fear as a weapon. We all go through trauma, without exception, every single one of us. Some of us go through more of it and it's worse than others. I know you know what I mean. Fear also comes from the choice to take risks. 
Now this is our comfort zone, and in our comfort zone, we still experience fear, but if we're willing to feel more fear, we'll step out of our comfort zone where there exists, yes, fear. And this was my particular version of stepping out of my comfort zone that I'm known for. Other people can uh, get married, have babies, start a new business, become activists. The one thing that I know about everybody in this room is that we all are willing to take risks where there involves, yes, more fear. As for what to do about it, similar to sadness, we have two choices. I had a client who was kidnapped two years ago by her ex-boyfriend, tortured, held hostage, and she was now having so many troubles. Her form of resistance is she was trying to understand her fear and understand what happened to her, which is the most classic form of resistance to feeling it that I see, because it puts us in our heads dealing with it intellectually. She was also trying to control her fear. We may as well be trying to control the universe. All we can do is kink the hose on fear. Next thing you know, it was recirculating round and round for her and showing up as an exaggerated version of itself in the form of an anxiety disorder. Also flooding into her mind, her thoughts, as insomnia. It can also build up and explode out the cracks in the form of a panic attack. She experienced PTSD in the form of anger, which is fear's fight version. If you have any kind of trouble in your life, the resistance and kinking the hose on fear either has something or everything to do with it. I'm helping her, though, shift from resistance to intimacy. And when you do this, it unkinks the hose and these problems resolve and are prevented from happening again in the future. So this is teachable. On Thursday, from one until two, I'm going to facilitate you guys, if you can make it, on shifting from resistance to intimacy. I, I hope you come because our relationship with fear is the most important relationship of our lives because it's the relationship that we have with ourself at our core, our own bodies, and the nature of life itself. So we want to make it the best relationship possible. I only see fear as a good thing, only as a good thing so long as we know how to handle it. Thank you. I'm sorry, but I don't want to be a, an emperor. That's not my business. I don't want to rule or conquer anyone. I should like to help everyone if possible. Jew, Gentile, black man, white. We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. We want to live by each other's happiness, not by each other's misery. We don't want to hate and despise one another. In this world, there's room for everyone, and the good earth is rich and can provide for everyone. The way of life can be free and beautiful, but we have lost the way. Greed has poisoned men's souls, has barricaded the world with hate, has goose-stepped us into misery and bloodshed. 
We have developed speed, but we have shut ourselves in. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. Our knowledge has made us cynical, our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much and feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Without these qualities, life will be violent. صعبة تغلبت على الخوف فقد اخترت الصحافة كي أكون قريبة من الإنسان ليس سهلا ربما أن أغير الواقع لكنني على الأقل كنت قادرة على إيصال ذلك الصوت إلى العالم أنا شيرين على عقله
to those of you here in the audience in Oslo and to those of you watching at home, thank you for joining us for this conversation. We're going to be talking about Shireen Abu Akleh. On the 11th of May, 2022, she was shot in the head and killed. She was at the Janine refugee camp in the occupied West Bank, where she was reporting on an arrest raid by the Israeli Defense Forces. Her group were clearly identifiable as journalists. She was wearing the blue vest with press written in big letters. There was no warning shot. In brief, Israeli forces said they had not fired at Abu Akleh. A number of independent investigations, including the UN High Commission for Human Rights, concluded they did. Israeli forces then said that firing at her was accidental. Investigative journalists have called it a targeted Israeli killing. Israeli police officers then attacked pallbearers at Shireen's funeral. It was violence condemned by the group of 15 Christian churches of the Holy Land as a severe violation of international norms. The US Department of Justice, the FBI, opened an investigation into her killing and its results are still awaited. Those are the facts in brief. Independent journalist Dalia Hatuka was a close friend and colleague of Shireen Abu Akleh. Like her, she's Palestinian-American. I want us to begin, Dala, our conversation with uh, Shireen in life. If you were a Palestinian family sitting down to watch the news of an evening, Shireen Abu Akleh comes on screen. What are you seeing? Um, first of all, I, I want to start off by saying that um, to tell the story of Shirin is to tell the story of Palestine, which is um, a story of courage, uh, strength, and resilience in the face of um, many indignities of living under um, Israeli occupation. Um, Shirin was known um, as a lot of things. Uh, she was a symbol for w many women who came of age in 1997 uh, when Shirin first joined Al Jazeera. Uh, she was called a trailblazer. She was called um, a hero. Uh, but above all, she was a journalist. And she was Palestinian through and through. And that's the driving force behind her work, her motivation, her will to tell the stories uh, nobody else wanted to tell. Um, I would say that uh, Shirin was devoted to covering not just uh, the conflict, but she, she documented um, so many things, um, the invasions of Palestinian towns and villages, um, uh, home demolitions, child incarcerations. Um, she bore witness to Israel's military rule, uh, which many human rights groups and the UN have called an apartheid system, basically a system that favors uh, a set of people over another. Um, the thing about Shirin is that she switched her major from architecture to uh, journalism, because as we saw in the video, she wanted to be closer to the people. She wanted to convey their voice and their message. Um, she was very calm and collected under... You worked with her, didn't you, in the field? Yes, and honestly, it was such a relief to work with her because, because she was calm and collected. Um, we would be getting shot at or we would be getting um, tear gassed and she would not be frantic. Um, she knew how to remain calm. She knew how to keep herself and her team safe. Uh, she never put herself or her team in harm's way. She didn't want to be a martyr. Um, she, she wasn't a diva even though she was a media darling. Um, but, you know, she knew the West Bank like the back of her hand, uh, the alleyways, the refugee camps, the towns and the cities. Um, and that's why the day she was killed, it, it was a horrible day. And um, 
I remember that there was something that struck me um, that day, which was uh, an Israeli military spokesperson said that Shirin and her team were armed, excuse me, with cameras. And it was a statement that to me revealed that Israeli authorities basically viewed uh, Palestinian journalists who documented uh, human rights violations as a danger. Armed with cameras. Yes. Yeah. You said she knew the alleyways, the refugee camps, the towns, the cities, and from all of those places, people were still to watch her funeral. And the numbers who came out onto the streets for her funeral were immense. Just give us an idea of that, because it, her funeral became a national moment. Absolutely. Her funeral was unlike anything I've, I've seen since the second intifada in 2001 or 2002, um, when a very uh, beloved Palestinian politician um, had died and thousands of people gathered and went to Jerusalem. And uh, it was a testament to how well-loved and well-respected she was. Uh, thousands of people came out on the streets. Uh, her casket was taken on the backs of young men and women, and uh, every single town wanted to hold on to her um, casket, uh, which was draped with a Palestinian flag and um, her press uh, uh, vest. And the the images that day of how Israeli security beat the mourners, uh, beat the pallbearers, and uh, basically snatched every Palestinian flag they could find, uh, even from the hearse, it just, it tore me to pieces. It was like she was killed all over again. And there was so much lack of dignity and respect for her. But to me, it felt like um, in life as in death, Shirin was bearing witness to these violations that happened on a daily basis. Can we talk more about the bearing witness? Because I want to, in the minutes we've got left, talk to you about the immediate impact for you and others trying to cover the Palestinian story, but also how you've had to perhaps change your practice, what you do, how you think about safety. So in the days afterwards, the shock of this, but then you've got to keep on reporting. Absolutely, in the, in the days after she was killed, I, I think in, within six days I must have done 26 or 30 interviews and I, I had to float, I had to do what I could to kind of survive, and, and that was to bury myself in work. But at the same time, um, as the days went by, I, I honestly started to be scared. I, I stopped, um, I hesitated before going into the field. I started um, calling friends or leaving WhatsApp messages telling them where I am. I started going with other colleagues into the field if I had to. Uh, there was definitely a chilling effect. Uh, and do you think that's persisted? Absolutely. Till this day, I mean, there, there were things that we used to do at the beginning. I would say there's the pre shireen killing and the post. And before her killing, we always made sure that if we go to a place where there's a raid or um, a demonstration and the Israeli um, forces are there, we would make sure to show ourselves, to stand even next to them so that they know we're there. And now none of us want to do that anymore. We're kind of thinking, oh, it's best not to show that you're a journalist because... And, and that is such a change because she had the press vest. She had the ID. She had the dual citizenship. None of it saves her. No, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, ultimately, when you're Palestinian, nothing else trumps that. And the fact that you are American or anything is, does not give you more rights than anybody else because you're ultimately Palestinian. So you and your colleagues, the, the journalists, the camera crews, everyone who's trying still to tell these stories, in practical terms, what do you do? I mean, how, 
how do you train or how are things changing? Um, there are a lot of things that we're doing right now. Um, we're trying to um, basically regroup, uh, do some training, uh, first aid, uh, do some um, other kinds of training to kind of improve our situation in the field. But uh, I mean, to be honest with you, ultimately, in the back of our minds, we're thinking, okay, I have my flak jacket on, I have my, you know, the press written all over it, I've got my helmet, but Shirin was killed by a bullet that went through the, the few centimeters between uh, where her um, vest was and where her helmet was. And that's a very precise and deliberate manner in which she was killed. So for us, it's almost like we know that we have a bullseye on our, uh, you know, target on our backs. And it's, it's a very heavy load to carry when you're out in the field. And I should say there's only in the last uh, few weeks there's been a report out from the Committee to Protect Journalists looking at the killing of Shireen Abu Akleh, which it says is part of a deadly decades-long pattern. CPJ has documented over 22 years at least 20 journalist killings by members of the IDF. 18 of those were Palestinian. Two were European foreign correspondents. There were no Israelis. Given those facts, for those who want to be in the field, for those who want to report, they they must, you must have fear, and your families have fear for you, more so now than ever. Absolutely. I mean, even before this, I, I would never dare to go out the house without telling my mom where I was going. Um, but now it's a matter of life and death. You tell everybody you know, you, um, you ensure you have um, a tribe, basically, so, uh, you know, a tribe of journalists that have your back. You never go alone. You don't go after dark. Um, and yet, in the current journalism industry, more and more of us are freelancers. It's hard to have someone to have you back. Absolutely. I mean, I'm a freelancer, and as an independent journalist, I get many emails from my editors being like, uh, listen, if you want to do this out of Ramallah in the West Bank, which tends to be more calm or calmer than other cities, um, then we totally understand because we can't protect you. And if you then take the decision, well, today it's too dangerous, too risky to go, what does that end up doing to the narrative, to the story that the rest of us get to see and hear? Honestly, the, the narrative is mostly dictated by whatever the uh, IDF spokesperson is saying, because ultimately that is the first, um, um, the first person that speaks up about any incident. And then when you get there, when you get to the incident, things are, are you know, are different. Uh, the person who was killed is long gone, taken away. Sometimes bodies are snatched and they're not given back to their loved ones. And so there is very little you can do. You can go speak to the families, obviously, um, but sometimes there's fear in the, in the families as well, especially if their homes are about to be demolished or, you know, if the parents are taken or any of that sort. So the chilling effect it, also has a, it has a ripple effect as well. So mm -hmm. not just on us, but on the families, on the community. Um, it, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult situation to work in. It calls perhaps for even more bravery by, from people like these, you know, citizens who want to stand up, who want to witness when they see that wrong is being done. Um, and, and that, that's difficult, isn't it? But citizen journalism, I suppose, is part of where we are as well. Yeah, absolutely. Like in the West Bank now, um, you see a rise in citizen journalism because, you know, everybody has, um, or a lot of people have uh, smartphones. And so because we can't be there everywhere, um, sometimes you see these videos that pop up 
uh, on social media of uh, people who have do documented uh, atrocities, basically. And uh, that's both important, but at the same time, it's also scary for these people because um, they are subjected to a lot of pressure from Israeli authorities. They are hounded, uh, they're um, asked to turn over whatever footage they have. It could be anything. And so even citizen journalists uh, have an issue with, um, with dealing with such a situation. A, a lot has changed. The death of Shireen had such an impact. I just want to give you a final word about what it's appropriate for us to remember about her. So it's hard to overstate just how well-loved Shireen was, um, not just in the Middle East, but all over the world. Um, how much she meant to a lot of people, to us as friends and family. Uh, we miss her, we miss her infectious laugh, her wit, her kindness, uh, her inspiring work. Um, but I think that to honor her is for us to continue basically and to uh, keep demanding justice and accountability, um, not just from the soldier, but also from the system that killed her. Dalia Hatuka, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. are built on a big narrative in everyone's mind. That's how they grow your fear. An artist understands myth. And an artist has the tools to undermine that narrative better than anyone else. HRF's Art in Protest program supports dissident artists courageously using their art to challenge authoritarianism. When I heard and found out the police is torturing people in prisons, I started to perceive art as an instrument with which I can say my individual view. Tyrants are pretty much afraid of artists, especially. can awaken the minds of the people. And that is what tyrants try to suppress. Through the Art in Protest residency, as well as a digital online gallery and the ability to distribute their artwork, we offer a safe space for dissident artists to expand their practice and connect with new audiences. Many artists can bring a new vision to the existing human rights issues in different countries. The clock is ticking all over the world for tyrants. Really simple, all we want is freedom. No violence and brutality. We fight together and we march together for peace and equality. Hello, everybody. They just gave me three minutes, so please, I ask you to give you, me more two extra minutes. If you agree, just raise your hands. Cool. Now I can feel comfort. Uh, I am Abdul Rahman Al Mawas. I'm from Syria, from the White Helmets. Uh, today, I'm here to talk about Sham. Sham, it's a little girl. She, like we met her under the rubble. 
She was suffering for more than 40 hours after the earthquake that hit no, uh, south of Turkey and north of Syria. We meet her and we spend like almost 11 hours with her under the rubbles. During this 11 hours, she told us a lot, a lot about her family, her dad, her mom, her brother, her sister, and she was asking us if they are alive or not. During this 11 hours, she was asking us to stay with her, to just be like near her. Sometimes she excuses like, some excuses like she is hungry, she is thirsty, sometimes like she is like her little finger is, was injured and she, we need, or she needs us to help her. After that, we were able, after 40 hours from working, to help her and to take her from the under the rubbles. Where this story happened, it's happened in the northwest Syria, in this area that it was targeting during the last 10 years. It was bombardment using a lot of like weapons against the civilians. The regime, the Syrian regime, with their alliance, they were putting the people between two options, to just force displace their houses or to die or just to admit he is like the president that they want. A lot of them, like sham families, they displaced from their own village, from their own like town and houses to another areas. She was originally from Idlib, and then they, she moved with her family to another place where the earthquake it came. We, when I say we, we are the white helmets, we are the first responders during the, the 10, years, we were like the first responders documenting and helping search and rescue firefighting and ambulance people from the under the rubbles because of the, the bombardment and later because of this earthquake. Let's back to Sham. Sham, she was like suffering from like crush syndrome that's happened after the earthquake because of the ceiling it was pushing on her legs. We take her from under the rubbles, moving her to the hospital, in the hospital in Northwest Syria, they were saying we cannot like dealing with this or with such like issue. So we transfer her to Turkey. And here, like the story, the real story, it's a start. It was like a good story for like a politicians to take. The United Arab Emirates send a medical flight to Turkey to take her from Turkey to Abu Dhabi. And then there, Asma al-Assad, which you see it here, she was calling Sham, telling her, oh, we are sorry for that. Asma al-Assad, she is like Bashar al-Assad wife, the Syrian regime like president or the dictator. And her, his wife, she was responsible about like this image, how they will use this humanitarian stories to make all this happen and how to well start normalization. Of course, the United Arab Emirates, the United Arab Emirates, it was like the first country starting this normalization. And they took this story to start a lot of, of issues and operation with the Syrian regime. I think the three minutes, it's almost done. So I just want like to, to make it sure like all this normalization, sorry, normalization relationship with a dictator, with a violent dictatorship, it will not reduce the blood, it will not reduce the conflict. And you can see that now what's happening on Ukraine with the same allies of the Syrian regime, with the Putin. And the question, it will be what is next if we will leave them to do what they want and we will not unit against them because we are the majority. Thank you. I am um, profoundly grateful that you're here to share this special, special experience. For us, um, the team has just worked so hard, so tirelessly, and you have brought your time, your most precious resource, and you've, you've given it to us, so we, we are so grateful. Um, I realize that I'm standing between you and lunch, so I'll be a little brief. Um, I, uh, I, I, I, again, just so grateful, and the people that are on the stage today, 
I'm so floored by, I'm sure you are too, um, the heroes that we just keep hearing about, including the incredible man who just, who just preceded me, um, are, are so deeply inspirational. And we're, we're delighted to be able to, to, to connect them with you. And we hope you can really take advantage of that. And those speakers, look, they're here to, to be with you and to connect with you. So, so don't feel shy. Go up. Network. Uh, they they want to meet you uh, too. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go way, way back. Um, this is a picture from the first Oslo Freedom Forum. <laughs> I, uh, I was very young. Uh, it was 2009. Um, a, lot, a lot has happened since then. Uh, it's been an incredible experience to just go through my entire adult life as, as part of this uh, family, as part of this community. Um, you know, the first conference wasn't meant to be anything more than a one-off. It was supposed to be a lecture series almost where the heroes and dissidents of the 20th century like Solzhenitsyn and Wiesel and Havel could impart their lessons to the heroes and dissidents of the 21st century. Um, but, you know, after you all came and saw it, you said, no, you need to keep going. And, and due to the generosity of our donors, who uh, we are, again, so grateful for, we, we have been able to keep going. And um, for that, uh, from the bottom of our hearts, we thank you. It's been a, a real honor and privilege for me to be a part of building this monument to freedom over the last 15 years, this challenge to dictatorship. And I truly believe that tyranny is, is, is an existential risk to humanity. We hear a lot about AI and climate justifiably as existential risks, but we very rarely hear about tyranny as an existential risk. But all we need to do, as I'm sure you've heard this morning, is ask our friends the Uyghurs. It, it is an existential risk and we, we must confront it urgently. And that's why it's critically important that we stay on guard against autocratic impulses everywhere, including in liberal democracies. As we know, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Julian Assange spoke at the Oslo Freedom Forum in 2010. He was here on this very stage. He was happy and healthy. He spoke truth to power. He gave a talk called The Whistleblower, which really spoke about the essential nature of leaking government secrets in the name of the public good. He defended free speech and press freedom as classic liberal values. It was April 2010, and Julian had just released a video called Collateral Murder that showed American war crimes in the Middle East. It's no exaggeration to say that WikiLeaks would, would go on to play a part in changing history. Um, what the largest protests ever on the planet couldn't stop leaking information to the public could. Whistleblowing and free speech are an essential part of any democracy. As Julian says, the greater the power, the more need there is for transparency. The government should not spy on the people. The people should spy on the government. And so it has been alarming to see what they have done to him. He has been captive in a maximum security jail in England for four years, where he spends 22 hours a day in a two by three meter cell. His health is declining rapidly. I through different conversations, believe that if they do move him to a maximum security prison in the United States, he, he may kill himself. Like, like many of you here in the room, he has been detained for his activism and has been the victim of an international smear campaign. Just the other day, he lost an appeal at the British High Court and now awaits, probably again, a transfer to a supermax prison in the United States where he would most likely be subjected to solitary confinement in a prolonged way, which is, of course, torture. Um, this isn't, though, just a British or an American problem. If we criminalize journalism in the West, like the US government is doing now by trying to use the Espionage Act against Julian, then we chill free speech for everyone on the planet. If, when we in liberal democracies jail our own critics, this reduces our moral authority and it emboldens dictators to more relentlessly persecute their critics. So obviously, Julian cannot be here today to talk to you, but I, I'm honored to, to stand up for him and for all defenders of free speech, whistleblowing, transparency, and journalism in the world. Many of you in the audience are, are those kind of people, and I'm, I'm here to stand up for you, and I'm here to stand up <clears throat> for Julian and for anyone else who's challenging authority, who's challenging power. That's really what this is all about. So again, thank you for being here, and free Assange. Thank you very much.
Cool. Thank you all. Uh, just a quick friendly reminder, um, if you got ushered in with a temporary badge, please check in with the registration tent to make sure you have a real badge for tomorrow. Um, and also, uh, enjoy lunch and come back and enjoy us for an afternoon of...